Reactive Training Systems. Hey there, welcome back to the RTS podcast. Today's podcast guest is Julian Pinot of StrongFit. Now, this is a really interesting episode and one that I think bears a little bit more introduction than uh, what we usually give to podcasts like this. Uh, Julian's a very interesting coach. He's got a lot of interesting ideas, uh, a lot of unconventional ideas. Now, I've been following Julian's work for quite a while now, uh, a couple years, I think, uh, somewhere in there. Um, he's been on other podcasts. Uh, he's got a YouTube channel and he's been on social media and whatnot. And so I've been uh, connected with him only at, at that length. Um, and I've familiarized myself with his ideas a bit, and I've always it's always struck me as very interesting. Um, it also always struck me as something that I didn't quite fully understand. I didn't really fully understand what he was saying. You know, I didn't understand the ideas he presented it. Um, but I will say that the times, the couple times, handful of times where I've implemented some idea that he suggested, uh, it's worked out very well for me. So I was kind of in this uh, juxtaposition where like, here's some ideas that are interesting and conventional, but they don't really make sense to me yet. Uh, but then when I try some of the things, they seem to work. So that, of course, only makes me more interested. So I contacted Julian and asked him if he was uh, interested in being a guest on our podcast. And he agreed. And so we recorded uh, this episode. Now, this is the longest episode that we've ever recorded. Uh, it comes in around two and a half hours. Um, so there was a lot of information to digest there. Um, so I wanted to familiarize myself with really the current version of what uh, Julian believes. Uh, he's a, the kind of coach that's continually refining his ideas, continually trying to make them better. Um, and that's something that I really uh, admire. I, I like that. Um, so I wanted to familiarize myself with his ideas, but also to challenge him where I could. Also understanding that, you know, if I'm just becoming familiar, uh, you know, just fully understanding someone's argument, I probably don't see the holes in it, you know, right there immediately. It takes a little bit of time for me uh, to digest those ideas. So the main goal here was to, to have an interesting conversation, do my best to understand his ideas and then digest it, you know? So I'm actually recording this introduction a few days later, you know, after, uh, we recorded the podcast for the most part, because I needed some time to digest some of those ideas. Now I have more questions now, uh, and they're probably harder questions, but I think it's important to consider that Julian probably has good answers for those questions. So uh, I'm eager to uh, have another chat with him in the future. Now, uh, some things that I think uh, are important to know as you go into this. Yeah, some of the ideas are a bit unconventional, um, but take a special effort not to straw man uh, any of his ideas. Do your best to, to really understand them. Assume that there's something really valuable in there and that if you could just understand it, then, you know, it would uh, be meaningful for you in your training. It would be a positive influence for you in your training. And then if you could, uh, uh, once you've got that kind of understanding, that's where you can uh, allow yourself to start poking holes in, in arguments and ideas and whatnot. So that's kind of the approach that I took with it. Um, Julian's an extremely interesting extremely intelligent coach, a coach that's willing to, to buck conventions. So uh, I really enjoyed uh, this conversation that we had. If you like conversations like the one that you're about to listen to, um, if you listen to this and think, hey man, that's great. I wish that they would do more stuff that's kind of a little bit further out there. You know, that's not the same old stuff. Here's what we're certain of. Here's the things that we're really safe, you know, in saying. Um, if you'd like to push that boundary a little bit more, you know, let me know in some way. Uh, send me a message, uh, leave us a positive review or a comment or something, and let us know. And we can do more stuff like this in the future, including uh, having another conversation with Julian where we try to poke at these ideas a little bit more. I think it's important to poke at all ideas, figure out what their strengths and weaknesses are. Um, that's, that's an important part of the process. 
Um, so with all that said, I think that's pretty much all I wanted to cover uh, here in this introduction. Um, here it is, our longest podcast to date, uh, conversation with Julian Pinot of StrongFit. So, all right, man. Well, um, like, like I was saying, like, I'm really excited to, to get to chat with you a little bit. Um, but at least for my audience, I, I think there's going to be a lot of people who don't know much about you or, or don't know much about, um, kind of what you're about. So, um, if you don't mind, can we start with the, I guess, kind of the standard, you know, introduction, this is who I am and all that stuff. Yeah, so I'm more, um, so I own StrongFit. I created StrongFit like uh, a long time ago. I had a gym in uh, Los Angeles area for, uh, that was like, what? Sorry. Sorry, I tried to sneeze. <laughs> uh, I remember because I opened the gym three weeks before the crash, before the financial crash. So I remember that. Um, and then, but I've been in sports all my life. So I've been at a, like I started, I remember we were uh, on the French team going for the European championship of soccer when I was 11. And so he went on from there and everything. So this has always been my life. And when I was like 18, 19, I found uh, grappling, MMA. And uh, I, got, I was talented for it. And I did, uh, back then I was just doing like bodybuilding and everything. But then I found bodyweight exercises because it related to jiu-jitsu and grappling better and my coach put me in charge of the physical prep another physical preparation just a warm-up for the class and his instructions were simple he said look we have a very small room there's 20 people that's too many i want you to make them do the shit you do but i want you to kill all of them so that we go down to 10 i was like i got this i do it for three weeks murder everybody we turn around now there's 40 people <laughs> he was like that is not what i asked he was like i don't get it the more I kill them, the more they come back and they bring friends too. And so I discovered I had some kind of a quality toward murdering people with training. And then they actually liked it. And I realized that I was um, enjoying coaching a lot more than competing, if that makes sense. Like I, I, I love sports and competing, but I have found my vocation in coaching. And so since then, that's basically, so I was, a, you know, like a personal trainer as well. But I've always done high level sport so i got a lot of it from grappling like the cuban system so obviously i study strength and conditioning a lot B but uh, always with the yes, with always coaching in mind so that always and i had everybody from pro athletes to very to uh, normal people whatever that means so always with an approach of having to deal with a person first so i'm a humanist at heart at heart so for me it was always about seeing the person do better not necessarily give them the shiniest program ever. And so over the years like that, I started to see patterns of movement between the top athletes to the most normal people and between all sports and activities I was doing as well. And so that over time led me to become a what CJ from Invictus called a movement specialist. And so I ended up training athletes, but always I was going back to the same people with the same patterns of injuries. And so more and more, I got involved into the aspect of trying to get them to perform without breaking constantly, because obviously when you break, you cannot train, you cannot train, you cannot perform. And so for me, the performance ended up being building the base of the pyramid. The wider the base, the higher the pyramid. That's something that always struck me. And so before you know it, my job, my job became to make sure the athletes were ready so that the coach could take them toward a higher performance. Awesome. And so I became the power behind the throne, so to speak. <laughs> in the back that you don't necessarily hear about, but I make sure that the coaches can make their athletes shine. Yeah. And so, the... and so I basically been involved into that side for years now. That that makes sense, I think. Um, so kind of where I got an introduction to your stuff was actually through listening to some other podcasts and and interviews and stuff, which led me to. Uh, your YouTube channel and have, have been just trying to gain a better understanding of, of what it is that you do. And, and I know that there's a lot of depth to it. So uh, you teach seminars, uh, yep. but you also teach uh, a coaches week. Uh, and I think for, for a lot of people, you know, to, I mean, just to hear that, like on its surface, like a, a like basically a week long course, you know, there is necessarily a lot of depth there, yeah. you know? Uh, I mean, in fact, I don't know. Uh, 
a lot of coaches, at least powerlifting coaches, I, I don't think would be able to teach for a week and and I think they would run out of stuff to say. Oh so. no, I never run out of stuff to say. I can't talk, to <laughs> <laughs> talk to people that know me. But um yeah it, because the system goes the the problem is we are in the fitness industry is we are stuck at the same as the medical field which is description based. Right? So you run out of this it's like if you try to do an anatomy chart, eventually you're gonna run out of muscles to to say but the humans don't work based on description, they, based work, uh, they work based on function. And so that, that's where really I started to work is to base all I do on function is not the description. It sounds uh, very simple when I say it like that, but you run into problems, very simple problems. For example, they tell you the pec is an internal rotator, right? So the pec internal rotator, the humerus. I'm like, okay, so that's the basically the description of what the pec does. I'm like, okay. So I take a PVC pipe or like that peg stick in front of me and I bend it using my pegs, right? And that creates an external rotation of the humerus. And yet I engage my peg fully. Hmm. So now we have a problem. And so I can go on and on and on like that of the problem of description versus function. So, um, and then that basically started the entire system because the, a lot of the, uh, the argument was basically the notion of tension torque versus just the action of, for example, flexion or extension of the shoulder to me doesn't, doesn't mean anything because you can do it in a number of ways. I was like, that's a description, right? What's the function really of pressing? I was like, okay, so if I look at pressing in nature, you take throwing, uh, swimming, punching, whatever you want, you're always going to have a tension that seems to carry toward the center of the body. So that's what we call internal torque, right? And yeah. I was like, okay, so there's internal torque. And then then we go back to, for example, CrossFit a few years back, and they were always teaching the snatch in an external torque, in an overhead position. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, so how come every movement in nature is telling me that whenever I press, I have to go toward internal torque, and you're telling me the snatch is an external torque? Are you telling me this is the only movement in nature? Not that you would snatch in nature, but you get the idea. The only basically movement where I would need external torque overhead, whereas every other movement, I would need internal torque. It's like, I don't get it. I don't get it. I was like, so then I started seeing when I don't get something, usually I get frustrated and then I start looking for myself. So I started to try to understand the difference between description and function. And that has opened up a door that there's, there's so many rabbit holes that came out of this because then from there, I mean, we can, we'll talk some more, but from there, I basically started to look at internal torque versus external torque. I started to link certain muscle groups to that and they're either in one or the other so that led me to the idea of basically you had only two muscle groups. Muscle group that use internal torque, muscle group that use external torque. From there, I started to go toward the nervous system, sympathetic versus parasympathetic, how that could lead to that. And then you get the breathing on top of it. And before you know it, the, the rabbit holes keep going and going and going and going. Yeah. So we, we definitely jumped straight into the deep end here, which, <laughs> which yeah, is fine. Down, but yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. That's fine. Actually, we, we can kind of go with this, but... So the, the torque thing is an idea that I wanted to, yeah. to dig into a lot more. Yeah. So I, I saw in one of your YouTube videos that you mentioned that when you're talking about torque, you're n not talking about rotation. Cool. So rotation is the description. Torque is a function. And again, we get stuck into that way of thinking of just explain to me what the joint does. I'm like, but rotation doesn't mean anything, right? It's just a position of the joint. That will depend on a number of things. The function, for example, pressing is how, the most important thing is how do I create tension? And so that was the idea of torque, which is a little bit like, you know, like a drill. It's linear versus rotation. The key is how do I create the most tension possible on a movement, right? So what do you do when you bring the barbell? You, you know, you start basically to, to create tension. There's always that so it can be a, like uh, an isometric contraction toward rotation, but it's not rotation per se. It's the action of creating tension. That's what torque is versus rotation, which is just the position of the joint. That to me is not, again, it's description versus function, right? Okay. So it's the action of creating tension. So if you look at movement, you either create tension toward the center of the body or away from it. And so that was the beginning of internal versus external torque. So uh, to try to put this in, in terms a, a powerlifter would um, be able to wrap, wrap their head around a bit more. So imagine um, 
you're in the bench press and yep. one of the common cues in the bench press is to try to bend the bar. Yep. Um, so that's, of course it's a steel bar, so you can't bend it, but that action of, of trying to bend it, that's yep. what you're talking about. That would be an external torque because you're trying to, to bend to the outside now. And that's in the lowering phase of, of the bench press. Exactly. So you have, for example, that's very important because you're trying to bend the bar. So you grab a PVC pipe, right? If you actually bend it like this, you're going to engage your pec. So now you're in internal torque. You can't engage your pec in external torque. So depending how you bend the bar, you're either going to be able to load your latissimus dorsi like you want on the way down, or you're going to end up engaging your pec. Not necessarily the way you want to go if you go with 500 pounds plus on the bar. So that's the problem. If you say just bend the bar, I'm like always, oh, how? Because again, you might, you're a great athlete, so you might feel the movement. It is natural to you. That's great. What concerns me is the people that are not as good, not to say nicely, not kinetically aware, out there that are just going to try to break the bar, maybe do it incorrectly, load the wrong muscle, and now they hurt themselves. And then they come back and they say, but I bent the bar. I'm like, yeah, but that as a description, but not, the function was incorrect. So it's something that they use in, not, not to go in another rabbit hole, but it's something they use in basically computer science that is called Q-learning, which is a new way they're training artificial intelligence which is the idea of state versus function. What matters is what state you're in. And if you're in the correct state, you can take all the proper actions. If you're in an improper state, there is no action that can be taken that will result in, the, in what you want. So in that case, it would be if you create the tension incorrectly, I don't care what the movement looks like, you're going to hurt yourself. So you can look like you're doing the movement perfectly, and yet you keep hurting yourself constantly. So, so when you're saying tension, you're talking about the kind of your intention uh, with exactly. the barbell. So, like, yep. what are you trying to do with it at that point? At yep. that point, whether or not it's it's actually having a, a yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's yeah, yeah, exactly. It's your intention to have the barbell. How are you trying to bend the barbell? Obviously, you're not going to bend it, but it doesn't matter. You are going at it a certain way, and that's going to allow you to engage. A, number, a certain group of muscle a certain way or another. If we're going to go max weight trying to bench rest, for example, it's very important which muscle I'm going to use to lower the bar, which muscle I'm going to use to press the bar. If your intentions on the bar are incorrect, you're going to use the wrong muscle groups and you're going to get hurt every time. Or you're going to put your shoulder into the wrong position and now we have a problem every time we bench. Okay. So, so that would, yeah. I had a just kind of a, a weird offshoot question that popped in my head uh, when I was thinking about this. Is it possible to have a movement that would be uh, kind of an internal rotation movement with an external torque? Totally. And I can have an, in, an external rotation of the shoulder while creating internal torque. As one has nothing to do with the other. Okay. All and right. that's what they get uh, confused. The, an example that kind of came into my mind actually yesterday I was training, I was doing, uh, doing pull-ups yep. and I thought maybe that's an example, uh, because there's, there's a bit of internal rotation, but when I feel my, like, if I pay attention to how it feels in my hands, when I'm pulling, it's, it's an external torque. Yeah. You can do uh, or it feels like an external torque. Yeah. But for example, you'll see this a lot when people do pull-ups and they go to their traps. You'll see an internal rotation of the shoulder. Not that they should, right. but they do. Uh, you'll see an internal rotation of the shoulder, and yet they're loading the upper trap, which is pure external torque. This is what you're going to use to do a power clean or stuff like that. We know pure external torque movement involves the upper trap. I can do that on a pull-up. Even though my shoulder internally rotates, I'm in full external torque. You'll see it like you take a PVC pipe overhead, and you'll see people that are their shoulders internally rotated overhead. You make them bend the pipe, and suddenly you see an external rotation of the shoulder. Bending the pipe engages the chest. If it engages the chest, the chest and the shoulder have the bicep, they're an internal torque, even though you, you've seen their shoulder externally rot rotated. And I think that's where the problem started, is we look at description and we went, that's the function. And so we saw people externally rotate the shoulder without understanding which action was being taken. And we say, ha, you're supposed to externally rotate the shoulder. No, you're supposed to create internal torque because state becomes comes before action. And so by limiting ourselves to description, we have not understanding the proper intention and without the proper intention, 
you can engage, you can do the movement incorrectly, even though it looks like you're doing correctly. And so now you end up with people very frustrated and confused because they look like they're doing the movement and yet it's not working. I see. Yeah. And so you can, they can do ex look, at, fine, not look exactly like you, but they go like, I do exactly what you do. How come you're benching 500, I'm at 200 and my shoulder hurts every time? I might not. And then so they start to do the movement and everything, but they still go back to an improper function. So, so it's in kind of the devils in the details with, uh, with something like that. Even worse yeah. in the intention, because if yeah. so, if I look at all you look at is a description, which is a position of the joint, then you will never, you, you might not be able to fix a movement because mm -hmm. the guy is still going at it with the wrong idea. And that after that is cheating into trying to look a certain way. And then that's, that's going to wreck them. I had that problem with a lot of classical dancers. <clears throat> They work a lot in plié and things like this, so they go to an external torque with their hips constantly. On lowering on a on a squat, I wanted internal torque, but classical dancers are so good at controlling their body, they could make the squat look perfect, and yet they would wreck they would wreck their hips every single time and their knees because they created the wrong tension. But while ma while making it look like they were doing it perfectly. I'm sure you had guys that cannot deadlift over 100 kilos without blowing up their back, even though they look like they're doing it correctly. So that's that's an interesting thing, right? So the, in particular, the uh, internal and external torque as it relates to squatting and deadlifting. Yep. So tell me if I've got this right. Yep. Um, <clears throat> the, the squat would be uh, external torque, and that's kind of what we see a, a lot of times uh, – you hear people talk about screwing your feet into the floor, the knees out position and stuff like that. Depends when. There's a moment when external torque has to be used. Okay. But then, okay, but there's the problem because we assume that squatting is, uh, we talk about with a barbell. The barbell has been around for 150 years, right? As human, we've been around for 300,000. We have not lifted a barbell. That means to me, there is no such thing as a squat with a barbell. It's in the sense of it's not one movement, it's two. I mean, it's three. You have descent, of the weight, which is not exact. I don't know when you would actually put a weight on your back that heavy over such a small place and actually manage to descend it with, while staying upright. Mm. We have not, let's put it this way. We have not seen that in the last 300,000 years. It doesn't mean we can't do it. It means that we have to understand what it, the rules evolution gave us and adapt what we do based on that. Right. So, for example, what is a squat in nature? The only thing I can think of is a jump. Right. So yeah. a jump requires external torque. Knees move out and away. You screw your feet and then you get everything you, you can. But that's not loading for the jump. Loading for the jump, if you go, if you look, you go the other way to load. So that means to load on a squat pattern, on a jump pattern, you're going to go internal torque. And to actually go up on the concentric face, you're going to go external torque. That's interesting. OK. Right. So imagine so if you jump off a high box. Would you land with your knees coming out and in external torque, or would you land with your ass coming back and loading your, your glute, uh, glute max and inside hammies and everything? So you're talking about like, uh, like you're on something high and you jump down. You jump. Like how, how, do how do you, you land? Yeah, how right. do you catch yourself? You're, you, you're not going to land in that external position. Like exactly. you're not going to land with your knees out. No. So yeah. 300,000 years, you've loaded for a jump in internal torque. Yeah. Huh. You know, hmm. that poses so, a problem. Okay, but so then I have I'm, another because I have another one. Now, okay. do you need to break parallel for a jump? No. No. So give me a movement in nature where you would create power with your hips below your knees. I can't think of one. Neither can I. So yeah. that would mean that that particular face from out of the hole into a jump position right is in internal torque now that would explain why coming out of the hole you see some of the, the knees of the powerlifter come slightly in like Steffi Cohen look at her squat when she comes out of the hole you see the knees coming slightly in and it's not by her knees it's basically internal torque because she, she's engaging all the the inside head of the hammy the glute max and everything and it brings your knees basically in and back slightly so look out of the hole like your knees come back, not forward. So uh, I'm, I'm thinking about the way that I do things now. Uh -huh. um, so one thing that's come to mind, I, I've been 
focused on the front squat for about a year now. Uh, and I've noticed that um, I'll get a little bit of, of knee pain, like nothing serious, but just a little bit of knee pain um, from time to time. It's better. It goes away if I, if I let that knee in medially just a little bit, you know. Exactly. And if you start with your hips coming back, not straight up. Not yeah, much. So it, Look at the intention. Not so much. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, it, I don't feel anything at at least not consciously at this yeah. point at the foot level. It uh -huh. for me like wh where are, get my words jumbled up. Where my uh, consciousness, I guess, is focused is is on my knee position. And mm -hmm. so what you're saying is that's not that's not valgus because valgus is is uh, duction. It's not that? Right. It's not valgus need. What you're doing is you're engaging the inside head of your hamis. Now, it's very hard to feel unless you actually, you know, consciously try to uh, get the movement. What you're doing is you're creating, you're basically engaging your posterior chain in a way. And so that creates it, that puts the inside head of the hammy engaging and that turns your basically femur slightly. That bring, brings your knee slightly in and now you're in the right position to get out of the hole and then you can create external torque. Now, look at the, Olympi uh, look at the Olympics. Look at Olympic weightlifting. Look when they catch the clean. When they get out of the clean, you see the knees coming back in and the hips going back. And then, and then they go to a jump position and then they go into external torque. That is the pattern you see for all powerlifters, all front squats, all at the top level. So are we saying all the top, top thousand people in the world are doing it wrong or, or they found the natural way of doing it because they go internal torque into external torque because that's the rules evolution gave us. So what you're saying is that, that so we, we've got a term for that. Um, we've always called it uh, a chess ball pattern. Um, not to say that that's, uh, it's just a description of, of what's yep. going on, right? So that when they get into that bottom position and you see the knees drift back and the yep. hips come up, yep. uh, the back angle increases. Slightly. Um, <clears throat> right. Um, we've always I'm looked at that as, as a, a position where they're not, able to generate enough force with the quads uh to to maintain that position and come up evenly all at once because which they're not supposed to i'm because, sorry because they're not supposed to because the quads are not designed to create that kind of power from that position because for three hundred thousand years you never faced that position like we are the winners of evolution we have been basically it's our ancestors that kept winning 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 a position that has not been seen we are not built for you never had to create position with your hips, uh, like that kind of any force really with your hips below your knees. Normally you hinge your way out of it in order to get to a jump position and then you go back up. So, so you, what I'm so you would see this. Thing. So kind of going back and, and we may have kind of skipped over some of some of this stuff, but that's okay. I'm going to just kind of let it, everybody else uh, catch up as they can. But so you would see that, like when we talk about fundamental movement patterns, a lot of people will talk about uh, the squat, uh, the hinge, and in terms of lower body, those are kind of the big two, right? So you would maybe say that it's not the squat and the hinge. You would say maybe it's the jump and the hinge. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So, so you, with regard to a squat, you're saying that that bottom position change is mm -hmm. a hinge. Yep. And from there, it, it turns into a jump pattern. Yeah. And that would explain all the cleans at the Olympics. Most of the powerlifting squats that I see, most of the front squats, we all get out the same way. So if you're, say you're coaching a powerlifter, yep. um, you know, a, a top end guy and who's getting ready for some major competition, mm -hmm. who's exhibiting that kind of pattern, does that tell you anything about their um, strengths and weaknesses or is that it maybe that's a, a pattern that you encourage and try to feed into um, like that, that what does that tell you sure I think that's like that, I think he's doing the correct way 
Okay. I so that what na that, that nature gave us, evolution gave us that movement pattern. So if, if you have somebody that's not doing that, do you try to get them to do that? Uh, well, I haven't seen anybody over 90% that is not doing that. I've, I've honestly seen a couple, you know, it's, it's not very many, but they, they tend to be in, you know, the people that come to mind are, are not low level uh, at all, really, but they're, they're extremely technically minded. You know, so they have a, a model in their mind about this is proper technique and and it doesn't include this uh, this hip shift okay, but, fall pattern, right? Again, the hips going back is a description. What we want to know yeah. is out of the bottom of that squat, which muscles are they engaging? That would be the, the only way we would know what they're truly doing is if we could either on EKG or whatever. But to me, the, the test would be we put an EKG, I bet you at the bottom of that squat, no matter how, what their torso is doing or their hips is doing, they're going toward internal torque. That would mean certain muscles. Inside head of the hammy, more than the outside. The glute major versus the glute mid. There's a number of muscles like that that will be engaged more at the bottom of the, at the, bottom of the squat than when they reach that jump position. Okay. So it's, again, it's not description, it's function, right? It's which muscles okay. are creating the tension to get out of that bottom position. And then we will know if I'm right or not. Okay. But so far, so, that's how I'm fixing, like the knee pain, for example, on stuff like that. I've been mm -hmm. making sure you will engage into no talk out the bottom, and he has fixed the knee pain almost on the on the constantly. So you're not saying at all that uh, that that tells you anything uh, about what their deficiencies are or anything like that. That this is just the the natural pattern of things, and and yep. that's uh, you would have to look elsewhere really to find. Uh, to find deficiencies. So right? I would test the squat on, so the jumping things with like an Anderson squat, remember Paul Anderson? Sure. That would tell me if they're good in external torque. And then I would test the hinge and then see if they at any point use flexion extension of the spine, are they able to have a, a, a complete hinge? Then that would tell me something about basically their capacity to create internal torque. But by the way, how come there's a sticking point on the squat? Did you notice where the sticking point is? That's usually on that exactly at that jump. Okay. So maybe the sticking yeah. point is to switch from internal torque to external torque. That's a that's an interesting point too. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but hasn't that uh, come up? I'm I'm trying to think. I, I want to say that I've heard you mention that in a couple other, like not related to squatting exactly, but in related to other movements. Uh, oh, all right, so you know what's very interesting? Look at a push press. Okay. Where's the sticking point? Look at the push press. They go like this, and mm -hmm. sticking point, and then they go like that. So they go from external torque to internal torque. That's where the sticking point is. What do you see on the bench? They go, and then they go this way. You see a sticking point. The sticking point is the switch from one torque chain to the other. That's why you get stuck. The bench press thing is interesting because... Um, so you're, you're talking about having a switch between the torques during, uh, during one phase of the movement. So it's not like, uh, it's external on the eccentric and then internal on the concentric. There's like, if you look from the side that there's a, a, uh, kind of a two phase bar path where the bar comes back yep. over the shoulders and then makes a, like a push press. Right. Yeah. So same thing. It's just uh, from a flat position, right? Exactly. So external torque into internal torque. Okay. All right. So then. you would have this as the same thing as there. And then you would see the same sticking point being the shift from one torque chain to the next. Okay. And so you use certain muscle here, different muscle there. So the deficiency, you could see when you're failing this way, you know, the it can be the sternocostal, sternocostal part of the pec major, like you have certain part of the tricep because that belongs to internal torque versus if they can't get off the chest, will tell me they have an external torque problem. Okay. So that's when I'm going to see basically where, where you fail. It's going to tell me which chain is not working properly. And, and you would target entire chains at a time, really? Yeah. Right? Okay. Exactly. So if they're, if they're deficient in uh, internal torque, then you're going to look at the entire you're going to train the entire internal torque chain together. Yeah, because I believe from what I saw and 
more I go into it, the, the, the true I think this is that we either are in internal torque or an external torque. We have two muscle groups. We have internal torque chain, external torque chain, and they're all linked together. You, it's not a Chinese menu you don't get to choose because it links to the nervous system. And so you're either in one or the other, but you can't be in both at the same time. Got it. Like, so there's one, one that's going to create the movement. The other one is going to support the movement. So it's a concept of the arch that I talk about all the time, where to me, the body is not, uh, it's not a line where you either, like, you know, it's not like I go uh, one system nervous and I switch to the next. There's always an arch where in the sense of to build tension on one side, I need to build tension on the other. So there's a torque chain is going to move and the other one is going to have to stabilize if you want. But it's the play between the two. So when I mean you're in one torque chain, I mean, you are, you're moving with one torque chain, supporting with the other. And then after that is tension between the two that allows you to, uh, to, to move the weight, basically. Okay. Which, has, would have, uh, which could explain, what's interesting about that is suddenly explains what is Tom Sherrington's law. You know what I mean? Like agonist, antagonist. They're telling you like to, to contract an antagonist, an agonist, you have to relax the antagonist. So that means that to contract the bicep to the max, I need to relax the triceps. All right, you've done a heavy bicep curl, or as CrossFitter call it, a supinated hang power clean. <laughs> they like it better when I say it like that. Yeah. Uh, you cannot relax the triceps. Hmm. Have you done a max? Tell me, tell me on a really heavy bicep curl, you relax the triceps. <laughs> Talking to the wrong guy. Uh, <laughs> powerlifters uh, generally are afraid of bicep curls as well. Really? Uh, <laughs> Super needed hang power clean, so let's go. Right, yeah. But, you know, I mean, I mean maybe this is, um, maybe to use a different example, and, and the complexity is going to muddy this up a little bit, but in the bench press, you, it, it's funny because in the powerlifting community, when we talk about bench pressing, you've got one group that tends to be, uh, no insult intended, but a bit more of the bros, who uh, talk about using the lats in the bench press. And they're convinced that the lats are a major player in the bench press, right? But then you've got the more, uh, call them the evidence-based guys, who are saying the lats can't be involved in the bench press because the lats are, you know, they're going to pull your arm down. Whereas they're not you're... based on, I'm sorry to tell them, but this because they're missing the concept of the arch. I, let's do a simpler movement that you can't get around that one. How about dumbbell rows, heavy dumbbell rows? Everybody does them. Do you notice the heavier the dumbbell is, the more you engage your pegs? I have noticed, uh, sorry, I keep changing the, the exercise on you, but uh, I have noticed, uh, so I was a really good deadlifter, uh, mm -hmm. deadlifted a lot for a lot of years, uh, got hurt, took, some, took a lot of time off the deadlift, started deadlifting again. And I notice every time I deadlift, I get a pec cramp. No, that shouldn't happen. Like that doesn't yes, make sense, right? Because you're in the Right. Well, that. It's so, yeah. anytime, anytime you are faced with uh, an event that happens in the world around you that that shouldn't happen, that just means that you don't understand all the circumstances around you. Right. So, yeah. So the problem is they are going a description. They're going with Sherrington's law, and they say agonists have uh, contract, therefore antagonists relax and everything, and therefore the lads cannot engage in the in the bench and everything and uh, i disagree for me it's it's again the idea of the arch right so well, is, yeah, this touches on this touches on a, a probably the the at least the hardest to understand component of of torque from a powerlifter's perspective yeah. the deadlift yeah. so the deadlift is is a hinge uh, think off the floor up to a certain degree yeah so okay. we have a problem with the deadlift is we are using so much weight in a position you cannot find in nature because every time you lift in nature, you're going to go in between your legs. So what you have in nature is like a stone lift where you're going to basically grab something in between your legs with your ass very high, so a pure hinge, put it on your lap and then do a jump with it, like an external torque movement and everything. We get with the barbell, which allows us in a very, very specific position that unfortunately we have not faced. But because of the barbell, we get very, very strong, which is great. But we have to understand at least the movement. Off the floor and everything, it's a hinge. It's not a, a, the conventional deadlift. 
the sumo is different because but the conventional deadlift you see you are in a hinge pattern you are internal torque this is why you see most powerlifters engaging their pecs like crazy and you see the 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 strongman basically never with their knees out you can see the knees are always basically uh, going forward and then once you reach over your knees then you get to a jump position and what do you see strong men do they hitch the shit out of the bar a hitch is a jump pattern so whenever you get to on top of the bar and you start failing what do you do you hitch you go to a external torque because that one then that would be when you would normally use it at that stage because now you go to a jump pattern which you cannot do in powerlifting but well, that, even if you even if you're not hitching it's still kind of uh squatting the weight it, it, it's it's like the same type of thing it's just uh more controlled more patient yeah um, you stick with it yeah yeah you just uh, uh don't start jerking it you know but, yeah exactly because uh, that's what you would want to do naturally but because of the bar and and everything you can't go there so you stay with it but you stay basically in internal talk the entire time that's why you felt your pecs that's why the inside uh, i mean everything so you will not see the good deadlifter with that knees out position like back over arch like they all tell you is a proper by the way if you look the proper way to deadlift i haven't seen the top best thousand in the world to use okay so well we that's start? that's kind of what i wanted to to get into a little bit so we're talking about it being a hinge at least off the floor mm -hmm. and that would be an internal torque position yep. and with with an internal torque position am i getting something wrong that you would be trying to twist the floor internally right mm -hmm. with your feet yep. that yeah and, and i guess that's just the thing that it's not a that's not a uh, a thing that that i see any any top deadlifters doing or at least that they're not aware of it that's the thing is most of those guys do uh do it naturally okay right? They find tension uh, in the usually, you know, in properly in their core, their legs or whatever, and then they start pulling, right? But if you ask which muscles are being engaged, you end up more or less with the same list. The key with the the foot uh, doing this is me. It's a cue that I've been using on people that do not deadlift correctly. That can't find the right tension. They keep basically creating stone torque and then they wreck their SI joint. And so, in order to fix that, I make them find tension the other way if you want but that's because it's uh, in that case it's almost like a description really is to get them to find the right tension people that they lift over 600 don't have that problem because they're good and they found the proper tension right away but if you look at the position of the strongman for example you will see that it's it's closer to an inch than a squat there's no question there so so you're not talking about a dramatic thing no. right you're not talking about like really trying to to twist hard and and point your toes in no no point your toes in never because that would be a mistake so basically again like just like we we said you know you can have external rotation of the shoulder while into no torque it'll be the same thing i don't even care if your knees are on the outside what i want is i want you to engage the inside of your legs to pull and not go crank on your si joint and over arch your back if you want Okay, so the because back positions come up a, a couple times here. If if you've got somebody who uh, can't maintain any sort of uh, uh, neutral spine position, yeah. they are basically falling into flexion as they deadlift. Yeah. Can you tell anything from from that one thing alone that they're doing incorrectly? Yeah, it's uh, so to me internal torque starts at what I call the main arch which is always around the midsection. So uh, the problem is, for example, the rectus abdominis, the six pack, is uh, in that sense, I don't want to say misunderstood, but it, um, like you have the four pack right in the middle, right? I can act, uh, that basically acts toward external torque, allows you to, you know, for expansion. Whereas if you look at the top part right here, the lower abs into the external obliques and the transverse, allow you to go more toward the hollow position. So that would be internal torque. If you look at all the movement the gymnasts do, it's always internal torque. They create tension toward the inside. You think about the iron cross, all that stuff, they're always in internal torque. If you look, that's what the hollow position is. It's an internal torque. So that would go external obliques toward the transverse and things like this. If they don't, if they don't have that, they'll go naturally more toward external torque, which is pushing that four, that four pack forward and trying to over arch. 
So usually when I see them either trying to keep their back super straight, they cannot make, and then collapsing like this, that means they could not maintain the external obliques and transverse, that internal torque at the, the pull of the movement. If you, uh, it's a very simple test where you get those people and you'll see usually they push their four pack forward on the deadlift instead of trying to push their sides out. If you push your stomach forward, you take your organs away from the spine, you should never want to do that anyway, right? And you'll see naturally the good powerlifter, they push their side out into the belt. That's why the belt can also give you a great feedback compared to that. So that means if, once I push my, my sides out, I'm going to engage the external obliques, the transverse, put myself into internal torque, and that gives me the kind of tension that I need to hinge off the flow. Hmm. When they start to lose that, that's when they do weird stuff with their back. Usually they go toward pushing their, their four pack out in or the other way, and then they start to collapse at the midsection. And that's so, what I call the main arch. So it's... it's uh a core problem more than anything else, right? Like a, in terms of like activating the right musculature. I, I believe it starts there. The problem with the core is we think, for example, the, the rectus abdominis is one, it's one muscle, but it's just because it's connect, connected doesn't mean it's not linked. For example, if I put a kettlebell below your belly button and I ask you to push as high as you can, like you'll notice people will flatten their back onto the ground and go into almost like a hollow position, not almost, into a hollow position. If I put a kettlebell on top of your belly, like past your belly button, uh, a bit higher up, and ask you to push as high as you can, you're going to end up arching your back. So that yeah. shows you that the activation of basically what is still the same muscle is done differently depending on where I put the kettlebell. So the rectus abdominis is not that simple. It's not just one big muscle. Parts of it go toward internal torque. Parts of it goes toward external torque. It makes no sense if you look at it from a description point, but as a term of function, then it starts to make sense. I see. I see. So uh, again, you, and you, you do something similar, uh, not to take us too far away from the deadlift, uh, important topics here, but yes. uh, you do something similar with uh, the bicep inside yeah. versus outside head of the bicep. Exactly. Yeah. So and it's bicep and everything else. On one muscle group, but two heads. For yeah. me, they don't have the same function. The short head of the bicep helps you to add into the tour. You're thinking all the gymnasts. All that stuff, whereas the long head of the bicep on the outside helps you to work external torque movement, like uh, the third pull on a, on a power clean or things like this. Like you take a sandbag and you try to toss it as high as you can, and you'll see the long head of the, the, long head of the bicep getting, uh, getting worked, right? Whereas if you go more toward uh, squeezing the shit out of a ball, you'll get all like uh, the rings and everything. You'll see the short head of the bicep working far more. That's why you, it's a different kind of pull. It's usually here on the short head, and then you have a, uh, more like a frail of the tendon on the long head. They don't have, they don't have, the same, they have the same description, but not the same function. I think part of the problem is the anatomical chart in that sense is wrong. Okay. It has, it has description, but it does not give you function, and it has that leads to confusion toward a number of things. Okay. Um as far as as far as the deadlift goes yep. um and and you touched on this already but i just want to yeah let's do it. Let's do it. clarify it a bit more um so and this may be just kind of conflating uh internal and external rotation uh with with the torques again it seems like an internal torque yeah uh would cause you to to get kind of a, a reciprocal inhibition of the glutes uh but in the which part of the glutes that's the key is i don't want the glute meat to work on a deadlift i'm going to want the glute major because that's a hinge look at a sprint yeah the sprint is a, is a hinge but well, i suppose i'm referring to the the glutes in in that they're there's nine muscles again again it's it's uh uh kind of getting back into the, the conflation of torque and rotation because yes. no, 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 the glutes that's are going to externally that's, rotate no, no, your that, that's thigh, right? That, that's part of the problem. They are telling you that the glutes can only be activated if you rotate the feet out, right? Well, that, well, that that's what would happen with a glute contraction. So if, right. if the glutes right. contract... So that, let me ask you, okay, so let me ask you a simple question. What about on the sprint? You've seen the sprinters, mm -hmm. right? They don't create external rotation with their feet when they sprint. They go reach. If anything, they go in internal. So are we saying they don't engage the glutes? I mean, that's definitely something that I'm not, uh, that I don't know enough about to, to 
so common intelligence. Like, like I know that when they they reach out, that there's a, a bit of like internal rotation of the foot. But, yeah. Is there not? Uh, They're not going this way. No. Look, ask all the sprinters. They go this way, not that way. Sure, yeah. sure. It, that that it's not. But then we don't use. It the doesn't move. have to be like a dramatic movement, right? No, but the tension. If you ask them, they don't create mm -hmm. it like this. If anything, they go like that. Like, okay. like they put the tension here and they go this way. Okay. Like, uh, no, I know, but this is the problem. They are telling you fine, that, because I've heard that argument so many times, like the only way to activate the glutes is through external rotation of the hip. Mm -hmm. So that means we, uh, the only way, so that if we say that, that means, for example, there is no talk about uh, internal torque ever, right? right? So, all right, so that means uh, a sprint would have to be an external torque. That means a kick toward the outside is not as strong as a low kick. That means like there's a number of movements where it basically it doesn't work. Like if we say there's no internal torque, that means the sprint is on an external torque. So you would see some somewhat of a external rotation of the foot, right? At the beginning of the movement, which you don't. You would say basically that kicking out is stronger than a low kick. So like the basically they're in the in the kung fu movies, they're right about that. Right? <laughs> that you're supposed to kick out, not in. There's a number of uh, so look at the sprint, right? You would see some external rotation of the foot when they reach toward the ground. When they touch the ground, mm -hmm. you would see not, not a major one, but you would see a slight external, basically creating external torque. Yeah. And yet that's not what you see. They, they literally tell you not to do that when they, when they teach you the sprint. Okay. It's, right. it, it's, that description is not working. Right, so uh, yeah. like you would see, so okay, so if we see that, that means at the bottom of the of the deadlift, right, you would see the hips basically low. You would see a, a an action of the knees going forward and slightly out. Or uh, do we see on the deadlift when they get engaged, we see the hips going back and in just like at the bottom of the square, a little bit. Which one would you say is the closest? So. I'm just trying to. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I, I think a bit slowly, which is probably not great for podcasting, right? <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> so, it's just listening two parts. It's all good. No, right. this is so, a very important part. So it's that's what yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's it's it. um, so I'm I'm thinking about the deadlift and 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 I guess this cuts back to another topic altogether. Um, cues. You know, yeah. so like where I, where my mind goes uh, is is okay. How do you how do you cue a person? Because we we know that you don't want them to turn in hard. Yeah. You know, it's, it's it's a subtle movement. It's an internal torque, mm -hmm. uh, but it's not enough that it's going to. Um, it, you're not seeing it. You know, it's not it's not something that you would you know you watch. Uh, uh, you know, some top deadlifter pull yep. a heavy weight and you don't see it, you know? So, so, I mean, I suppose you can, you know, go to the gym and try it and feel it for yourself. Right. So how do you do that? Like, how do I do that? So, if I'm going to go in my basement? Description and, versus function, which means I never cue description. I never cue joint position or even joint mm -hmm. movement. I cue function, which means, for example, I'm going to want certain muscle to be engaged. So in that case, that means, the main arch first. So at the core level, what do I want to engage? Do I want to basically push my uh, obliques out, for example, or do I want people to feel their uh, lumbar erectors when they deadlift? Do I want them to lock their L5 as hard as possible and crank on their SI joint as they start pulling? So going to an external torque, or do I want them to basically have them engage their low abs, external obliques transverse? So if I can just show them what uh, function that is what feel what is what does it feel like then they can reproduce that feeling onto the weight but that's the key i can't coach joint position because first of all uh, it's different from everybody but what i have to coach is a feeling you had deadlifts where you go that was right i don't have to describe you what you did you know it was right that's the principle of cue learning state versus action when you had that oh that's right that's a proper state we're going to get you there that's what I want. So for example, if I want to push the obliques out, I can put them, put a belt on, not that, not that hard, but just 
telling them to feel their obliques pushing against the belt. That's going to create a certain feeling. That's the state I'm looking for. And from there, we can start working, saying, I want you to duplicate that feeling. Not a position, because they, they're going to forget it an hour later anyway. I want them to, de to duplicate a feeling. So yeah. the key will be, when you have that deadlift, when you go, that one, I know you, I know you can pinpoint the best deadlift you've ever had. Sure. That 800 pounds and you felt awesome, you go like, that one. All right, so which muscle was that? We try to find that what was that, and we need to duplicate that feel because that feel means you were you had the proper function, the proper intention toward the bar. That's what we need to duplicate. That's what technical work is to me, is that not who my knee needs to be at 46 degrees versus ta -ta 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 -ta, that can never be duplicated anyway. That is not how human beings work. Right? I, I, yeah, it. I, I see what you're saying there, you know, that since intention is such a big part of this, right? Like you, a cue in that case, I mean, well, I guess it's not that a, a cue can't, you can't cue somebody toward intention. You you could, but it's got to be about a feeling because yeah. it's not about a positional um, observation at that, at that level. So you're trying to get them to intend in a certain way but not, you know, this much, but not too much, right? Because you could take any of the intention and exaggerate it too far. So it's more important that they feel it uh, rather than... Uh, but yeah, but for example, how many times did they tell athletes to do the workout or the lift before they go on the platform? <clears throat> right? Visualization. Visualization, like, yeah. Of people using, okay, if that's not intention, then what else? They're asking you to repeat your intention. So you're yeah. doing it already. You are, you're asking yourself to have a feel for the movement and to duplicate that feel. It's not, oh, what am I going to look like? That's not what you're doing when you're doing it in your head. You are feeling the movement you're about to do. That's, that's exactly the, right. Yeah. So you're doing it already. Yeah. That's the cue. You're doing it already. I just want to basically systemize that. I was like, that's the feel I want. Which muscle was that? Let's do it again. That's the cue, basically. So a visualization that you do before, just on target. So I think this is a, a good jumping off point then to start talking about what's more of, of like, how do you do that? How do you create those feelings? And I think that kind of goes back into uh, some of the, the training principles that I've heard you talk about. So uh, forgive me if any of this is dated and, and feel free to, no, no, no. to update any of this. Um, as far as like some foundational principles being intensity, blood flow and win. Yes. Uh, is that still? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Still. Okay. Yeah, so, do you, can you uh, can we kind of go through that a little bit? Yeah, like it's a. Uh, well, I mean, to use a fancy word, it's called hormesis. It means the favorable response to stress, right? Which was a very important. So, how do we make sure? I, I was trying to quantify basically good programming in simple terms, right? And so then suddenly I went into okay, so with favorable response to stress has to have certain components in it. Right. And it was the um, the importance of the first one was the importance of intensity. Like I remember Coach Abijaev, basically his idea, he came out of a very simple biological factor where the greater the stress, the greater the protein being produced. So from there, he was like, OK, so then the greater the stress, the greater the quality of the muscle I'm going to build. So then he took upon himself to inflict the greater amount of stress, physical and physiological upon his lifters. And so he would make them compete at a national level every three weeks to stress the shit out of them mentally as much as physically. And that was the Bulgarian system, right? So intensity is, is very important, obviously, without breaking people. So there's a, the backstory to that. The other side of the arch with homeostasis, where your body has to be able to take the stress you're going to inflict upon. That's OK. So but the idea also, which was very important from a biological level, is I was um, I was contacted by a stem cell researcher while I was in, uh, in Australia a few, um, like last year. And the guy is a reconstructive surgeon, plastic surgeon, and also a world-class stem cell researcher. And they found out that, because um, they deal with severely diabetic people, you know, they have the, like the wounds on the legs that never heal. And they found out that a very specific stem cell, when it was being injected, would allow them to heal at a normal level. So for a normal person, we're talking about the Wolverine healing factor, basically, right? Mm -hmm. And that stem cell is very, very specific it's only released during intense exercise. It's like we are built for violence, basically. We need a certain, like, a certain intensity, violence in a good way. I mean, by that, like, <laughs> a certain level of intensity right. to create certain physiological changes in the body. 
And we have an entire system that is designed for that. Like you have to crank the intensity to create a certain amount of results. Now, the intensity is based on many different levels and also it differs for people, right? That doesn't mean like they're not going to train like you do, otherwise they'll die. But they're still going to have to have, uh, it was the idea of progressive overload, basically. But based on a number instead of based, again, on perception, on how they felt about it. Now that will lead us to the nervous system, which I'll explain after, right? But so intensity for me was a very important part because it, it also, again, leads toward the, the nervous system, which is a whole different ballgame. So, so we're talking about uh, the intensity of, of the stimulus, not, yeah. not intensity as in uh yeah. the the exercise science definition of yeah. of like load relative to one rm uh, no 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 i'm not talking about that one I'm we're talking about the the uh yeah i mean how it's, it's intensity it. that's yeah. the only word for it right that's <laughs> exactly that how much you're putting into it yeah yeah there, there is a factor toward that because again like we're going to go toward the nervous system in this there's two there's two different sides to that but they're going to each create a different response well, before, before we, before yep. we go there, is it something akin to effort? Like, are we talking about, uh, intensity in the sense of, of like, uh, like the, the hardcore bodybuilder training where you're doing yeah. like strip sets and rest pause yeah, and yeah. stuff yeah, like exactly. that? Oh, like pushing a sled as hard as you can, like that kind of intensity. That's yeah. the intensity that doctor was talking about for the stem cells. He didn't mean percentage wise. It means how much you're stressing yourself. Yeah. Okay, so so intensity in in the sense of like if you had a really uh, bright light, like the the brighter the light, you would say the light is more intense. You know, exactly. the, that kind of that kind uh, of that kind of thing related to a stimulus. Related to a stimulus, yeah. Sometimes yeah. I use words that can be confusing because they're not necessarily the best description. Well, that, I don't think it's that. I think it's just that at least in in powerlifting culture, you know, intensity we've kind of beat it into everyone's head that we're talking about percentage of one RM, which it kind of, kind of is, it, it's, it's just not exactly the same thing, right? Yeah. Like a, if you're to do a single repetition with 50%, uh, versus 95%, 95% is going to be a more intense experience. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, but you're talking about just extracting that idea over the course of, of a longer period, more than just a single snapshot in time. Yeah, what I, what I didn't like about that definition of intensity when it comes to the way it feels, for example, is then it would say that basically pushing a, a sled for 100 meters is a lower intensity. Not when I do it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like you do yeah. a, tr a so truck pull in strongman, they have the heart rate at 200 for a minute straight. Okay, that, to me, that's max intensity in that sense. Like how yeah. far can I take the body before it shuts down completely? Yeah, so yeah. That, that's where the person, I understand why they use it based on percentages, because you have to be able to define that as well. Sure. What would you call going closer to 100%? So, but sometimes it leads to a little bit of confusion because of that. Right, and, and that's fine. We just need to clarify our terms, which okay. I, think, I think we've done. So intensity being a, a, a central tenet, and, and you were talking about uh, how the nervous system is playing into that as well. Yeah, um, that, that's very important because you relate to the win as well. Um, this is where I think uh, we are starting in the last 30, 40 years to really understand the brain and the nervous system a lot better. But I think honestly, for, for a long, long time, we have fundamentally misunderstood how this works. For example, the arch concept, one side versus the other. Like th there's a number of questions that I had for neurologists and they love me when I start asking because we go into deep conversation and they hate doing that with a guy that has no degrees whatsoever. <laughs> but I, ke I keep getting them every time on a bunch of stuff. Like they give you a straight line and they go on one side, which is parasympathetic state, right? Which is rest, digestion, everything. And as you go and you reach a certain level of stress, of intensity, you switch to sympathetic, which is fight or flight. I'm like, all right, that's perfectly fine. Where do we put sex? Sexual activity, the one thing that is keeping our species alive. Where do we put that activity in that line? Uh, so, I mean, you, I, I know you're going to tell me, but I've heard that uh, it's sympathetic uh, before and parasympathetic after. Uh, don't be because sympathetic is a vaso, uh, vaso contraction, which means it's literally uh, sympathetic stops blood flow. Hmm. 
So yeah. they tell you okay. parasympathetic and then sympathetic is orgasm. I'm like, okay, but so you're saying there is basically sex has the same level of intensity no matter, no matter what. Hmm. It's not working. Like so, I've been going at this for every which way. <laughs> the only way you can explain it is if you have the arch concept, which means one side building versus the other. Then as you go toward exit, uh, toward uh, orgasm, orgasm is sympathetic. But so that would mean basically that as you get more excited, if you go too far, the arch collapses, you have orgasm basically, but then you could build one versus the other, right? Well, how would you explain violence in sex? Violence is fight and flight. It would take you sympathetic, which means you could not stay excited because then it would cut blood flow. The only way you could, you, you know what I mean? The only way you can explain that is if you visual, visualize an arch where you have tension from mm -hmm. both sides, where tension from both sides allows the arch to go bigger and bigger and bigger, therefore to, to go in intensity again and again and again. The, the whole system tells you you cannot go into a parasympathetic state past a certain degree without switching to sympathetic. That means there is a cap to intensity in the parasympathetic state. That means there is a cap into excitation past which necessarily I would not go over. It doesn't work with the model that we have. You know what works is, for example, if you look at the nervous system from what Wim Hof has been proving, right? Wim Hof goes into ice, very, very cold. That's a sympathetic response you're getting from the ice, right? He puts you into a fight or flight. What does he do? He's going to breathe a certain way to raise his parasympathetic level to bring the heat up in order to last longer in the ice. So, so what you're saying is like the... Um, so there's kind of a metaphor uh, when it comes to the autonomic yeah. nervous system of thinking of like a, a teeter totter, uh, where you can be kind of tilted toward uh, sympathetic or tilted toward parasympathetic. That it's but that not that it's it's more like uh, that they're independent of each other and um, but connected. Right. So uh, I can't think of a of a good uh, visual for it, but what's coming to mind right now is, is like, think of like two thermometers, you know, uh, mm -hmm. where you can, you can, the levels can change independently. And probably most of the time, uh, they're inversely related. So if you're higher on sympathetic, you're probably lower on parasympathetic, but they don't have to be, uh, yeah. the key is if I want to, uh, my sympathetic to keep going up, if it keeps going up, eventually the arch will collapse. So to yeah. me, that means the only way we can make one side go up is if the other side goes up as well. Like there's one that moves and one that stabilizes, if you want. That you cannot go 0, 100. It's not a communicating vase, if you want. It's like, because that's the idea is that you, we all go to 100 and it's basically it's going to be divided 70, 30 or whatever. Whereas to me, that's not how the system works. The whole system can keep on going up and up and up and up as long as you have a tension relative to each other that keep pushing you up. And hmm. then everything starts crashing when one side reaches too much versus the other, like an arch where there's too much tension coming from the left and the arch colla will collapse to the right or vice versa. The only way we can make the arch keep going higher and higher and higher is if we keep bringing tension from both sides. One side is going to win slightly, so the arch can lean slightly to the right or slightly to the left. But if it leans too much one way or too much the other, eventually it will collapse. And so the only way to build an arch that is taller and taller and taller is to bring tension from both sides. So the the uh, this this makes sense to me in a in a way that um, when I was first looking into heart rate variability and, and trying mm -hmm. to wrap my head around um, the autonomic nervous system, yep. um, that you can be in, so it's exactly the way you you presented it initially. That that's how we teach autonomic nervous system that it's, you know, it's this yep. teeter totter, you know, and when you take your heart rate variability, you're either skewed sympathetic or parasympathetic. And that's supposed to tell you something about your recovery, um, or, or the, the processes going on in your body. Uh, and it's left up to you to, to kind of extrapolate. Um, but they, you know, so that's kind of how we teach it, but you, that you can end up in these situations where you kind of have both systems active at the same time exactly. um, or uh, I suppose you could have both systems inactive at the same time as well. Well, yeah, but like, for example, like you, um, 
look at so sympathetic state right is what you're going to do on a max box jump yeah you can see, uh, by the way so the parasympathetic is controlled through the parts of it we're going to get into that through the ventral vagus nerve right which controls the muscle of your face so sympathetic you know you start to make the scary cloak of face you're ready for a max box jump right you can tell the guy that's what you look at people in the street to see if the danger to you are they making the cloak of face or are they making the stoner face if he's right. making stoner face you know you're safe it's all good right all right so you always look for those signs right here that's the sign of the vagus nerve um have you noticed how relaxed the sprinters are yeah all right they're running as fast as they can so that makes no sense that, unless, unless you're right about that yeah inch, therefore internal torque therefore they relate to the parasympathetic at the highest level possible which through vagus nerve control the muscle of the face which means they're trying to achieve the highest intensity possible in the parasympathetic state so Wow. So you're relating uh, autonomic yes, activation to internal and external torque. Yeah, that's exactly uh, okay. what I'm doing. Hmm. That's and interesting. That, yeah, and that's what's worked the best. And then we're going back. So then what I'm saying is the body is a binary system. Okay. So, body, uh, yeah. and so I'm just trying to think here. So as it relates to uh, something, say something like powerlifting then, mm -hmm. um, so, well, if sprinting is is internal torque, and yep. you're going to benefit from uh, you know the running relaxed, you know, which yep. is a thing that's super common for yep. like that's the way that you sprint, right? Um, and then you have uh, external torque if that's going to be driven more sympathetic. Mm -hmm. uh, do you end up in one place or another? Uh, with something, I guess we can go back to the deadlift. Talk about the uh, deadlift. So do that, you yank has the floor as hard as you can on a deadlift? Do you try to, to go <clears throat> as hard as you can on that first on that first pull? Or do you apply tension and go <clears throat> through right. it? Yeah. So you you do so, you allow tension to build. It's it's more of a of a, a rocket rather than uh, um, a gunshot. So off the floor you're more like Continuous, you're more in the flow state of the flow. Hmm. Huh. So you would be more toward internal torque and parasympathetic then. You'd be more like toward the flow state than the angry clock of state. So have you seen the uh, deadlift face thing going around uh, Instagram? Yeah. So, so it's uh, people posting uh, pictures of their deadlift face. Uh, it's all crazy deadlift faces. Yep. That would be interesting to go through that and yep. and see what position that they're in. I have you know, tried. like first thing I did, <laughs> <laughs> and you can tell when they're about to hit you. That's where their face go. <laughs> when they start to go, uh, it's like oh, it's going to slow down now. Oh, that's, that's funny. But look at the tension that you put um, off the of the floor on a deadlift, and yet when you when you reach a sticking point on the squat, and you go. Mm, you make like you make that cloak of face at that second mm -hmm. point because you go into a jump pattern which is external torque whereas on the floor right off the floor that's when you try to remain calm if you get it too excited then you yank off the floor either you pop your back or just the bar doesn't go up so from a powerlifting perspective the bottom of a squat is internal torque uh, the bottom, to getting out of the hole yeah the bottom of the deadlift is internal torque the mm -hmm. bottom of the bench press is internal torque. So the bottom of the, of the bench press, like if you go off the chest, is external torque and then internal okay. torque. So All right. Imagine so have, oh, have you ever seen the Vitruvian Man from Leonardo da Vinci? You know the guy in the circle like this? Mm -hmm. right. yeah. So look at, um, imagine a bubble starting from that spot right below the, the navel, right? Mm -hmm. And look at a bubble that goes from the head to the knees. Actually, feet. If you draw a bubble from that spot, which is the center of the vitreous man, you get a bubble from the top of the head to the knees. This is basically uh, all that inside bubble when, it, when for max weight is, in, is external torque. This is where you're going to see the push press go. This is when you're going to see the, the, the jump pattern go. This is what you will see a boxer do. When he's outside of the bubble, like he's going to go into an internal torque, but at the beginning, when he gets pure, that's when they go like they start swinging very wide. You see the same thing in kicking and everything. It's like a bubble of external torque that basically leads you to here. And the edge of the bubble is the sticking point. And then outside of that bubble is all internal torque. So it's internal torque from the top of the head 
up, internal torque from that spot up on the bench, uh, internal okay. torque all the way up to slightly above the knees, and basically from the bottom of a squat all the way up to a, to a jump position. And so, so I ended up, I'll send it to you, I ended up drawing that bubble on the v men, and that's basically, that works. Okay. All right, yeah, I'd like to, uh, yeah, it's like really to cool visualize topic. that a little bit more. Yeah, it's, it's to help visualize, exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm just thinking about, like, uh, if you watch powerlifters in competition uh, as they're kind of waiting there backstage, getting ready to come out, the, the breathing patterns that you see are, I mean, it's, it's hard to make blanket statements, right? Because everybody's a bit different, but it does tend to be more of like the, the deep breathing uh, type of pattern. It's, it's very focused. It's very, it's serious still, but it's not, anyway, I, I don't know if there's anything to this, uh, this theory because uh, uh, like the, if, what I was thinking was that if the bottom position is basically the first position of difficulty that you're going to find yourself in, if that's internal torque, then uh, it's going to be uh, uh, yeah. trying to activate that parasympathetic. But now you uh, see why I right. made uh, Liz excel. I'm sorry? Liz, Liz, your lifter, Liz Craven. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's what I was making her do. I was making her excel through the lips because that's parasympathetic activation. Yeah, yeah. To get her okay. to find better tension of the floor. Yeah. Okay. So that's the, that's literally why I make people breathe the way I make them breathe. I'm gonna send you the that thing right now through Instagram. But yeah, so the, the yeah, so the for example, we know the breathing patterns influence the nervous system. Like that's I think by now we can all uh, agree yeah, with that. For sure. And so to me, it, it was therefore it will influence the if I'm right with all this, the basically muscles you're gonna use the torque chains. So mm -hmm. breathing will influence the technique. And so by making them breathe a certain way, I allow them to find the right, the right tension, the right intention, basically, which allow them to have a better technique and tend to go through the movement in an easier way. That's very interesting. That's, that's really interesting. So I, I, did, a, a, I did an investigation uh, on personality uh, late last year, um, looking at personality types in mm -hmm. uh, top level lifters uh, looking specifically at people who've achieved something at a, a relatively high level and yep. have been doing it for a long time and there's an assumption kind of built in there that those people would know something about what works best for them which maybe that's a good assumption maybe it's not um but you got to start somewhere so that's where we start, right? yeah. <laughs> you start so, with intuition and you see if it works yeah. right yeah so um what we one thing i i saw in that a pattern that i saw is that people that are, are more extroverted, people that are more, uh, um, it, it's two things really, people that are higher in extroversion and people that are higher in neuroticism really liked to get psyched up more in their training. Yeah. You know, uh, people that were lower in those two qualities uh, preferred to train in a more calm fashion. Now, I mean, I, I don't think that's, uh, uh, you know, a landmark breakthrough or anything <laughs> like that's, that's, you would expect that, you know, yeah. if someone is, is extroverted, then they, they like the external stimulus. If they're neurotic, then they're anxious and a bit more afraid. So they're probably covering up that emotion with, uh, with uh, the external yeah. stimulus, the, the psyching up. But I, I don't know, just thought of bringing that up. And, and I don't and know if I think it's the same thing. What you're talking yeah, I about. think it's actually the same thing. I think, uh, so that would means like uh, external talk relates to the sympathetic and everything. And that means it influences certain muscles more than others. That means you would have to have uh, certain muscles being more developed than others as you spend more time in sympathetic. Right. And then that means you would, uh, that means you would start to see certain imbalances in muscle groups based on that, on the personality of the person. So could you, would we reasonably expect that to to show up in uh, like in a powerlifting context? Would we reasonably expect that to show up in like a, a a muscle development standpoint? Like people that are high in extroversion, we expect them to be yeah. more sympathetic dominant, which means that they would be more uh, external, torque. external torque. So we would like if they took 
measurements of of certain muscle groups like will we could we could we look well, at that I mean, because it depends on how you build muscle so that would be very hard to do because some people build muscle naturally versus others but for example you could see in spasms a relation between anxiety and lower back spasms you mm. could start to to start to see things like this those neurotic uh, you know super anxious stuff you're going to see uh, a certain pattern toward external torque better where they fail you're going to see this, this, the same kind of injury, the, 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 the spasm, like they're going to start failing. If they train a certain way too much, they're going to start, they're going to start create more anxiety, right? Even in their behavior, that's going to lead to a collapse of the arch. So you're going to see them failing in competition or a certain weight because anxiety is getting, is getting them. So the way out of that would be just to balance them. They have to visualize differently. So we're going back to balancing the arch continuously, basically. Mm -hmm. And I do that based... So I think like those, for example, like uh, you have lifters, I'm sure that are very on the anxious side, right? Uh, it's crazy. To, uh, try them to make, you, you'll notice those people have a hard time excelling. If you let them excel, they're always like, right? Uh, they have a very hard time. Try to get them to excel while relaxing their four pack, right? Mm. And you will find that they carry so much tension there. It's ridiculous. They're incapable of collapsing their diaphragm and just relaxing their abs fully. That's your nervous people. They, that's where they carry the tension. This is the four pack that I referred to before, or the one you're going to push forward that allows you to go to an external torque. So that extra buildup of external torque continuously, that anxious tight starts to have its own effect on the, on the body, on the chain, which of course feeds, feeds itself. And now you create more anxiety that creates more tension. And they keep going like this until they end up in too much external torque continuously, which of course is where the spasm is. Right? Yeah. If you, where do you spasm? You spasm in the upper trap, you spasm in the glute mid, you spasm in the lumbar erectors. Those are all the muscles you would use on a high box jump. Those are yeah. all the external torque muscles. Yeah. The strain happens more toward the internal torque. It's like, for example, which are the muscles you form all? You form all external torque muscles, right? But which are the muscles that you stretch? Those are, would be the internal torque muscles. Look what you stretch. You stretch not the top part here. That's what you form roll, the mm -hmm. clavicular head of the pec. You, you stretch the sternocostal. That would be more toward internal torque. You stretch the short head of the bicep, right? You stretch your VMO. You stretch the inside of the hammy. You stretch the glute mid, the, sorry, the glute major. You stretch mostly the internal torque muscle, where most of your spasms are toward the external torque muscles. You can see the two different uh, personality even there. You can see it in the nervous system. That flow state is toward stretching. The, the external torque is more toward that anxiety spasm driven. So I think it shows even in things like this. I, I, can, I can tell you there's a relationship between anxiety and the lower back spasms. Because that's how I go at it sometimes. It's just out of relaxing the anxiety. And then you can see a lot of, of impact on the body directly. And that's a, a relationship that I would you know, kind of makes sense, right? Like if you you say to me like, hey, I've seen a, a connection between these two things. I think, well, yeah, okay, I can see that. Let's see how that would connect. Yeah, yeah. and so we have, uh, but look, for example, look at CrossFit, right? Look in the last five years, look at the physique of the women at the CrossFit Games. Uh, you will see a lot of those external torque muscle being built, right? You see the traps and everything. Have you noticed how they start arching more and more, all of them, like that six pack, that's especially the four pack being more and more prominent going forward and everything. They're not, even at this, they're not especially getting heavier. They're getting, they're starting to arch, arch, arch more and more. They have their four pack going forward more and more and more, right? Mm. As their anxiety is going up, uh, uh, basically they go toward external torque and you see the set, the development more toward one side than the other. I mean, which okay. is, so there's an entire relationship here I've been looking at for like, like over two years now, and you start to see the same pattern developing all the time. Sure, sure. So you look at the strong men, for example, personality wise versus you start to see more the mellow guys and everything that's more the deadlift, that's more internal torque, they're very good at carrying. You start to see the same kind of pattern always happening. See, that's, that's interesting as well. So if we want to uh, start to make this connection between personality and, and uh, ANS and torque, mm -hmm. um, again, if we, if, if we look at, at the data that I collected, um, we see that powerlifters who've been training for a long time, who have been 
uh, who've achieved a, a relatively high level uh, tend to be um, a bit low in neuroticism. Uh, so they're, they're about average, uh, about population average on extroversion. So, and, and of course there's tons of exceptions, right? But just speaking yeah. about the average case, yeah, exactly. they're like uh, 36th percentile or something like that. 36th percentile on, on neuroticism. Um, so th they tend to be a, a bit low. Uh, no, I mean, I kind of made sense of that another way. Like, look, if you're, a power lifter and, and, you know, you're going to be doing the sport, uh, that's hard and, and in some ways dangerous, you know, uh, you could get yourself hurt you're going to do it for 10 years, you know, probably, you know, that we kind of see some patterns that we would expect. They're a bit low in openness. So they like routine, you know, they're high in conscientiousness. So they're, they keep to their schedule and, and continue to do, uh, their training all the time, you know, and, uh, extroversion agreeableness. Those were, bang on average, uh, and then low in neuroticism. So I think if you're a, a highly anxious person, they're just a, not that you can't be a good power lifter because there's some world-class guys that are like 99th percentile for neuroticism. <laughs> um, but just that on the average, if, Hey, if you're going to stick around and do this for 10 years, they tend to feel a little bit less anxiety about things, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, but okay, then I'll go toward the uh, a lot of the CrossFit Games athletes that I know, at least on the women's side. And trust me, if we go on neurosis, it's a lot higher than thirty six percent. And anxiety level is going to be a lot higher than that too. Like if you uh, go, go in the back and see the uh, what happened with them when they had to clean a sandbag, which was a novel uh, exercise for them, and go test the level of anxiety and, and neurosis in the place. And trust me, you would see a whole different. Um, whole different area. But if you look also at CrossFit, it pushes external torque and the sympathetic state continuously, right? But the, mm -hmm. their, their exercise, they were always working toward external torque. It's always in the sagittal plane. It's a lot of jumping continuously, really. So they're constantly toward external torque. And then that is raising the sympathetic levels. And you see that imbalance showing into the anxiety and the neurosis going up and everything. Whereas I think uh, also powerlifters have worked a lot of internal torque because they work more higher reps toward uh, flow state, the assistance work that they do is mostly internal talk, so they do balance there, basically. Mm -hmm. I think you will see, if we could find a way to measure it, I think you would see that the balance in the arch on the physical level, in the muscle groups, will relate to a balance in the nervous system, and therefore in personality traits. Mm -hmm. Like you imbalance toward external talk a lot, you will imbalance toward anxiety and sympathetic state. So what about... Uh, what about someone who's, say, a, a, a bodybuilder? Then, um, but, but they're actually balanced in their in their uh, in their musculature. If you look, they go right. heavy, they go lighter, they'll go external torque and internal torque. They're actually yeah. quite balanced. Not to say they're not neurotic, but then <laughs> the lifestyle, the control of the food alone would make you crazy. But uh, yeah, so that that's another problem. But they actually fairly balanced in their uh, in the development of their of their yeah. muscles. So. If we were to look at uh, a balanced bodybuilder, if we could find a balanced bo bodybuilder, that's probably the question. Um, of course, we would have to take away uh, anything that can influence the nervous system. So we would have to take the drugs away. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you're on painkillers because the pump is too painful on one side and everything, you, you, you might, be, you might uh, uh, you know, change the data a little bit. But I would want to see that a more balanced physique would lead to uh, but in, not in the sense of description, in the sense of function, which means internal talk versus external talk, not just the way they look, right? right. Would lead to a better balanced nervous system, which will have an impact, actually an effect, I would think, on uh, anxiety levels and, and things like this. We know for a fact that exercise is the best drug out there against depression and anxiety, for example. And I think it relates to balancing not just the nervous system, but the talk chains as well. So when when you're saying like balancing uh, internal and external torque and how that's separate from uh, necessarily balancing the muscles themselves, yeah, how would you evaluate that? Uh, through movement. Then that would be the only way because you have to evaluate it through function. That means uh, I have certain movements to see if you can move correctly in internal torque or in external torque. That, that so will give me a better idea. So, like I've heard you mention uh, one time or another, 
um, like you kind of have some ideal ranges, I think. So you, one movement should be a certain percentage of, of a, another movement and things like yeah. that. That, that, that. That was, that was, uh, then the, I'll, 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 that is more based on my experience, you know, mm -hmm. like, but it's, it's really something, uh, it's like educated, uh, guidelines, Fine. you know, it's an educated guess, let's be honest, where I've seen certain patterns where I would like to have certain minimums for to know that you're not going to kill yourself doing the movement you want to do in competition in your sport or even in your everyday life like that those minimums for example are very different than coach summers in the gymnastic who wanted the range of motion the, the mobility of the shoulder to be far beyond what i think a common person will achieve so that one is more like my th you know the thing that i've seen and it relates to pattern like can you hinge properly uh, let's say a bar to mid chin without ever having to flex or extend at the spine. There were certain things like that where I thought were minimum movements that I would like to see a human being go through, right? At least a decent, and then from there we can start building. After that, if it's someone like a higher athlete who's a powerlifter or that has very specific requirements, requirements like breaking parallel on the squat, then that's going to require certain, uh, like a very specific mobility for to make sure that they don't break. Okay. Like they have the mobility. Because that means that, because mobility is range of motion while maintaining tension. That's the difference between mobility and flexibility. Flexibility is passive, mobility is active. That means you have to be able to maintain tension throughout the range of motion that is required for your sport. But that means there's two types of tension. There's external torque and internal torque. So that means in every position, you have the mobility in internal torque and in external torque. And let's say I descend on the squat and I don't have enough internal torque on the way down. That means I'm going to have to switch to external torque. And now I fucked up my back because external torque put me into a hip position that is incorrect for me. And because I didn't have a choice, I went there, but with a lot of weight on my, on my back. And therefore, either my knee collapsed or my hip collapsed or my SI joint collapsed or whatever it is. And now I hurt myself because I did not have the mobility to, therefore, the way to keep the tension, the correct tension, throughout the movement so i would have my own basic number that i have but i can we can you also have to adapt that to whatever sport it is you're doing okay like an olympic yeah. weightlifter is going to have to work on his mobility a lot more because at the bottom of a snatch if he wants to maintain proper uh, internal torque uh he's going to have to have basically a, a full range of motion while maintaining tension tension relates to heavier weights so the heavier the weight the greater the mobility to achieve the same position. And so, yeah, yeah, I think I'm so, so there's an entire it. thing. So it relates a lot to, uh, to the people that I see. Well, I think that's part of what makes this such a, uh, it's an interesting conversation. But it's also a, a kind of a bird's nest of a conversation that everything is related to everything else, you know? So yeah. no. we've uh, untangling that is, is not, uh, is not a simple process which is probably why you, you you teach the way that you do and that it, it takes yeah. time to uh elucidate all yeah, these because uh, positions I teach concepts I, yeah. I, I again i teach uh, function not description so i, I i'm not i'm never going to tell someone what to do i'm going to tell them how to do it which means i will teach concept and then i'll tell the coaches go find out for yourself if i'm crazy or not yeah <laughs> Because that's the thing is, I'm like, yeah. I don't want anybody to do something because I said so. That's the right. re that's that's religion, not science. I'm like, those are the concepts that I uh, that I think are correct. I want you to go try. Tell me what you see. Then we can compare. And if I'm wrong, then I'll get smarter as you prove me wrong. But that's so it's always a matter of uh, how, never of what. That's the difference between information and knowledge. And so to me, all those patterns keep. I keep finding them interacting and then, and then the rabbit holes keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper. And so that's why the conversations are never ending because right. then you start to go to our mental health and then it just keeps on going from there. Man. You know, I've, I've got some uh, topics that are, that are kind of like this uh, in, in a bit of a different space, but I was thinking about this uh, uh, chatting. I was actually chatting with a mutual friend of ours, uh, Jacob Sipkin. Yeah. Uh, it, chatting with him about it the other day. And, and I remember saying to him, like, I see why they say now that uh, such and such an idea drove that guy mad. You know, like I, I see where that comes from. Now, you know, it's, a, it's, it's funny because going, you know, 
Yeah, because there's a bunch of guys that took that jumped the shark. There's no question. And I have a bunch of people around me that ask, keep asking me if I'm ever going to go there. But first of all, I don't know because you don't know when you get crazy. That's the point. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if you take it too far, I'm sure you could go to interesting places. <laughs> right. Well, As I have some very concerned individuals around me lately because <laughs> uh, they're like, you're going a bit too far. They're like, I'm pretty sure I saw a pattern. They're like, right. sit down a little bit. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So what we were talking about, intensity and we kind of yeah yeah, yeah. sorry uh, so we went into that um the second was blood flow mm -hmm. you've seen all the stuff into occlusion training that he's been doing lately you know like wrapping and, and then they see a lot of hypertrophy out of that i've seen a lot of that because i do so much sled work at high intensity and i've seen uh hypertrophy out of sled work at a high intensity and a higher blood flow there seems to be an entire relationship there that's very new, like even occlusion training, like that's been only a few years old, but there seem to be, the bodybuilders know that for a very, very long time. And I think eventually we're going to start to understand exactly the importance of blood flow toward far more than just getting a pump. Basically, we're going back to our parasympathetic versus sympathetic. Uh, pleasure is blood flow, blood flow toward the extremities. So that's why the pump is so pleasurable, right? But we also, we know it also triggers uh, the bar, fine, that in my system, the parasympathetic nervous system would be triggered by blood flow expansion. So there, and then, uh, so there, there's a, and then that's where the, um, we know the healing part of the body is into uh, the parasympathetic and not the sympathetic. And so that would, I think blood flow will lead to some very, very interesting discoveries. Like for example, that doctor was talking about with the stem cell. I think the idea would be then that the blood flow has to be an internal torque in order to release that particular stem, stem cell. There's a number of things that will come in the next 10 years out of the blood flow studying that we're doing now. Hmm. I'm pretty sure I know where this goes, but we'll see over time if I'm, if I'm right or not. But I think it will be far more important. I think blood flow is far more important than, than we consider. You see a lot of the, um, the West Side system that they use like the 100 reps just to get the blood flow, just to get the healing process going. We've done that. We've done that in bodybuilding a lot as well. Uh, I think there's a very important part there, not just from the just the pure physiological level of just bringing like nutrients to the muscle. I think it goes way past that. I think it goes into the nervous system and activating the parasympathetic side in a number of things like this. I think it goes way past just the idea of, uh, yeah, it's a pump and then you get nutrients to the, to the muscle. Yeah, that, to be honest, that never resonated in terms of uh, a sufficient explanation. Yeah. You know, like it, it seems like, oh, well, increased blood flow brings nutrients to the area. Well, it's not like it's not like there's no blood flow going there anyway. Yeah, that, you know, that, like that it, quite made sense. It's like, yeah, like, OK, so but if we're seeing a, a, a notable effect, you know, then it seems like I, I'm, I'm with you that it seems like there's something else there. Um, I, I don't know what it would be. Uh, but your your is, explanation sounds like, as valid as any other I've heard at this point. Yeah, I've, well, we've gone into uh, into a number of things. Like for example, like through breathing and a certain movement pattern, I can stop cramping in literally ten seconds. They tell you cramping is a hormonal thing and everything, and there's no way around it. I've like I'll, when you, when we're in uh, Utrecht, I'll make you do sled sprint until you cramp, and then I'll make you breathe a certain way and move a certain way in the squat pattern, what we call a cyclical squat pattern, and make you. Um, by rep 15, the cramping has, has stops. I stop completely. Like mm. in a way, like it never happened. It's the weirdest thing ever. It's a lot of things we think are physiological to me are neurological. Have you ever done like, you know, you're sore as hell from a workout and you go do a few set of leg press and then suddenly the next day you're not sore anymore. We can do that. We can, I can do it now where if I do it a certain way at the end of the training, I won't be sore the next day. Whereas if I don't do that, I'll be sore. I've tested it on a, 500 people really so yep. can you can you expand on that idea anymore yeah okay so that's an, uh, that's, that's, <laughs> uh, that's a, a long one so the idea was the first time i played with that i was in paris i remember and i did a pure external torque workout it was uh peg shoulders and biceps right and i'm sore as hell the next day and so i take a day off i go back and i'm like whatever i'll do the workout again i was pissed for whatever reason so i do the workout again and i'm still pissed so I'm like, okay, fine. Then I'm going to do the same workout in internal torque. So I did pec, by, so pec, shoulder, biceps in external torque, very heavy. I go pec, shoulder, biceps in internal torque, 
little bit not quite as heavy, but same so same muscles back to back, right? I wake up the next morning, no soreness, no fatigue, zero. I was like, that was so weird. So I go back to the gym, I do the same workout again. Same weights, external torque, then internal torque. Work, woke up the next day, no soreness whatsoever, no fatigue. I did it the third day. Bored out of my mind, but still no soreness. And I've been able since then to trigger a number of things like that through cyclical work where I can diminish almost completely the, the soreness, not the effects of the training. The, that, that sensation of pain, of soreness, like that painful soreness, I can basically cut it down completely if I do a certain amount of work that triggers the parasympathetic nervous system. So that led me to believe that, of course, the, the soreness, the, the, the painful sensation is more neurological than physical. Like, of course, you have the micro trauma, but that if you trigger the healing process that the body has normally, then there is no need to, to basically to tell you to stop the next morning. There is no need to bring that feeling of, oh my God, you are hurt, stop training today, and things like that. That is more a uh, neurological issue and stuff like that. So there are, that we do not understand a lot of, process. we don't understand the nervous system fully yet. That's for sure. For sure, yeah. We've been able to trigger a number of things like that. Well, that makes no sense. If, like, you know, micro trauma, therefore, it's painful the next day. But you know that you've done that yourself. Like sometimes you do a little bit of training and then it takes the soreness away. So maybe it's a neurological thing, not a physiology, also a physiological one, but it's not as simple as they make it out to be. Yeah, that it's not a distal thing, that it's not a thing yeah. that's happening in the in muscle the itself, and, that, and it's, that it's, it's exactly. connected a lot more. That, I mean, that, it, there's a much it, deeper connection. Yeah, and I think... I think that seems reasonable at this point almost just because everything is a lot more connected than, uh, than like the pure mechanistic models, you know? Exactly. I think that we, René Descartes, uh, another French guy, uh, blame the French man, um, had a, a very me mechanistic way of looking at the body, which I think was very necessary at the time because we're talking 15th century where everything is magical. So I think there was a way for the medical science, uh, there was a need for the medical science to get better through a mechanist, mechanist, mechanistical uh, point of view. But I think we took it so far that we went only into description and completely forgot function. You saw that with psychiatry in the 40s where they only described symptoms. So the only way you, uh, schizophrenia is you just lobotomize people. It was just a pure description mechanistic view of like, your brain is not working, we drill a hole through it. There was none of the function at the time, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. That knowledge. Horrible. Um, yeah, but there was pure description. They were not interested in, in the why it was happening, we just know it happens. It became very, very mechanistic, very, very description based. And I think we are still stuck in that model on a, a number of levels. And lately, if you look at neuroscience in the last 10, 20 years, every year we learn more about the brain, more about the nervous system, and we start to see connections that just were not there before. That Now you can start to relate to a lot more to the Asian cultures when it comes to how the body, like the interconnection of the body and things like this. And so I think there's a need to go past that description, that mechanistic model that we all go through. I think it's far more connected and far more uh, complex and interesting. Than this, and I think the role of the nervous system is vastly underrated, hmm. which is yeah. making that thing that makes the muscle fire. Like, it, it might be a little bit more than that, but if you look what they give you, it's basically just hormonal and like soreness. It's always that, it's always just you know, it's mechanistic, there's hormone, and then the body gets sore, and this happens. I don't think it works like that. I think the neurological aspect is far more important, yeah. Well, I think that, uh, um. It, that sort of description seems to be catching on a lot more as far as uh, like our understanding of pain science, which I'm reluctant yes. to, to veer too deep into because uh, I know that my understanding is going to be limited, but I, that pain is a uh, function of the brain's interpretation of a signal. Yep. Not they, it's, yeah, yeah, it's intensity yeah. receptors versus pain receptors. Pain receptors was a René Descartes idea, again, yeah. where it's the foot next to the fire, you have a pain receptor that goes from the fire to the brain. Again, at the time, very necessary to have a better understanding, but also very wrong. We don't have pain receptors, we have intensity receptors. It's just the, the one of the roles of the brain is to, so the, that's why the, the heat and the cold feel the same at a certain level. 
Yeah. Right. And then it's because it's being sent to the brain as, as, as intensity and it's up to the brain to decide whether there's a chance for injury or not. If there's a chance for getting maimed, it'll say pain. If not, it'll just, ah, it's discomfort. That's fine. Yeah. And so that, and that's, that's to the core of the issue. It's not as simple as you have pain because no, 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 there's an entire interpretation of the brain. So now you have to, that's why some workouts will hurt others not. And then, so there, there are ways to shutting it off versus but when it's necessary versus not. You have people that have done painkillers for two, so many years that they, that they have an opposite effect where they feel pain constantly. Because yeah. they shut it off so much, it get, it, basically the brain learns to shout. Painkillers don't work anymore and all you're left is with a scream in your ear that you're in pain constantly. So that makes yeah, so, it very important to understand. So, so to tie this back to the, the recovery aspect, um, like let's take let's take a person who uh, say they they train normally but they just went on vacation so they didn't train for two weeks or something yeah. they come back and they say they squat mm -hmm. normally that leads to a week of soreness afterwards a yep. week of, of discomfort um, so what you're saying is that if they were to uh, don't need to were to do but... some some additional work that was internal torque. Uh, focused yeah. on internal torque, that that would help to activate a movement pattern and a certain breathing. And actually, I've done it. If you look on the YouTube channel, you will see mm -hmm. that I talk about with uh, Casper van der Bruen of Holland. Uh, he was coming off of nine weeks of nothing. He had ended up with a kidney infection because he was so burned out uh, and he did nothing for nine weeks. Zero. I put him through a big workout that actually we filmed parts of it. And then I talk about it for like an hour on the on the thing and I posted on YouTube and he ended up doing the whole workout high as hell after that going like, I feel so great. Wakes up the next day, zero soreness, hmm. none whatsoever. And I blasted him uh, with uh, shoulder presses and rope pulls. And after that, uh, send back squats and sled drags. So like hmm. just mean workout. And he's like, I don't, I zero. And he felt on a high when he left. But that yeah. was a very, very specific thing where I triggered the parasympathetic through breathing and also a movement pattern with a certain way. So it's not enough. The movement pattern had to be correct. The breathing had to be uh, correct. So it was a very, very specific parasympathetic uh, movement. I never let him go sympathetic. I never let him fight through it. I kept it all on the IT side, right? And he woke up the next day with a great workout, no soreness, zero, after doing nothing for nine weeks. So that actually I know because I've done it. And I have the video. It's all there. You can watch it. And I've I'll done this again and again and again and again and again. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check that out. But, yeah. uh, okay. That's I, that's, at the time, it blew my mind. So that ties in uh, ties into the, the third principle, I think, which is win. The win, yeah. You know? Yeah. And that's all the, the neuro, your neuroscience aspect of the, the necessity to... Uh, and win is not always getting a PR. That's not what I mean by that. It's setting a goal, setting a win for the day and achieving that to make sure that we don't live in a, in the, in a wrong mind, uh, mind state, leaving the gym in a wrong mindset. Like I'm sure you went home after certain workouts and you get home and you just can't wait to fight with a wife. Like you're, you're going to remember what she said two years ago. You're just going to look for that argument. Right. And everything. And that means you, you, you're living in a very sympathetic state, but if not handled properly, can lead to anxiety and can lead to a certain number of things. So the idea of the win was to have to decide what the definition of success was. And that's a very important part for me, because a lot of time definition of success is a problem because you'll see people, their goals is just enough so, they, so that they don't hate themselves. Instead of having goals that actually means loving themselves, their goal is just to not hate themselves. So there is, that means you're going to always be in that cycle of doing just enough to not feel anything, which of course leads you straight back to compulsive behavior and pain and stuff like that. So it's going to be very hard for me to build the proper intensity if every time you go home, you feel like shit, right? So to me, for me to be, so the win was that aspect of continuous continuity in your training consistency would come out of, a proper definition of success, deciding what the true goal was for the day. So I could okay. get you consistent. And on top of it, to try to get people to, uh, to write it in a place of love in the sense of the guy tells you, I want to lose 10 kilos. I'm like, okay, so you're telling me once you love, lost those 10 kilos, you're done. 
You're happy with your life and you're not going to ask for anything else. You're going to look at yourself in the mirror and tell me, oh, I'm good now. That usually doesn't happen. Or he lose 10 kilos and halfway through, does he say, yeah, but I want to be strong as well. Yeah, but I want to deadlift 300 kilos. Yeah, but I want to do this. And now basically you have no setup for victory whatsoever. And, things, and now that means driving towards sympathetic state when now here come anxiety. And so now we're going back to targeting the nervous system improperly and we go right back in the same problems. And now mm -hmm. the arch collapses. And so the win for the session was very, very important. Basically, like, uh, and it was like, for example, like how to learn new skills. The only way, like evolution for, you know, uh, mammals for the last million years has been the same way. To learn a new skill, you learn, you need to play. Yeah. There's no way around it. You, you see that with, you know, tigers born in zoos and stuff like that. The only way you need to play. So there has to be a clear definition of, how to learn a new skill. So if your session is to set up to teach someone a power clean, this is going to have to be done in a certain way. Otherwise, all you're going to get is frustration out of people, a sympathetic state, not necessarily what you want. And that's going to lead to the entire arch collapsing and, and you're not going to succeed at what you do. Okay. So that's... Uh... The more the mental side, if you want. Yeah, yeah. And, and important as well. Like I, I was just... Uh... I was just talking to one of my lifters and we were talking about kind of uh, mind state and goal setting and, and things like that and how um, from, from like a competitor standpoint uh, I want my guys to focus on things that are within their sphere of control. So from a, from a powerlifting standpoint, I can't control what that guy lifts. I can yeah. control what I lift. So I'm going to focus yeah. here and, and, and it leads to more of a, it, it bleeds over into training too. Uh, and I was talking, talked at length a, a, a bit about how uh, I kind of got sucked into this mentality for a while of needing to, to outwork my competition and needing to do more than what they were doing and, and how that led to, to really doing way too much training and, and got injured. And really it's why I'm not competing right now. Yeah. Um, yeah, but, but plus it, it yeah. leads you to, to Instagram to check what they're doing, which leads to more anxiety, which of course makes you do even more. And you get into it now, you're, you're getting away, away from your goals and you're never happy, by the way. Right. This is right. now you constantly stress. Uh, life at home sucks because you're getting into that weird cycle and then and you continue. And of course, now you feel it and you keep going like this. Those things never lead to the right stuff and also after what we would have to to see or see is that type of thinking what kind of injuries does it lead to to me it leads to always external talk so that's l5 that's and then i start to see the same pattern of injuries coming again and again and again and so that alone for you at your level like that means you're gonna imagine taking one year off means at your level yeah it's, it's so much training like i, I we were <laughs> right. calculating at some point with a friend of mine that uh, over the course of the year, we took like 10 or 12 crossfitters and the amount of work they were missing per lift was around 10, 15%. Because some session they go like, oh, can't snatch today. So you want 10% more work, don't get hurt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> stop, stop getting killed. Yeah, right. So, but that's, to me, like, for example, like, um, for me, for you, it would have been at the time, why did you get stuck into that mindset? So there was an approach to that that started at some point that you didn't catch. And then it would have been easy. But then you're in that, that, and once you're in that cycle, there's no one turning you away from it until you get hurt, unfortunately. Yeah. Like once that train starts rolling, man, it's so hard to, I know, I've been there too. It's yeah. so hard to stop. Like it's catching that, that early part where someone, something was out of balance. Yeah. And then that's why I keep pushing the lifter to work balance continuously in that mental state because I'm like, I need balance because otherwise that train starts going and then it can be very, very hard to stop. So, so as this relates to win, it, it's about setting, I guess, a goal for each session that uh, moves you toward your goal. And it's something, and your goal, your ultimate goal is going to be something that's, that's internally focused. It's, it's not going to be, uh, yeah, I won't like it. You know, like I do that a lot because I mentor on the mental side also a bunch of athletes. And uh, I'm not a life coach, by the way. I'm just saying. Uh, I'm just mentoring them on the mental side. Um, and he was like, okay, so I want a definition of a goal that you're going to get. And you can tell me you're happy. You've done it. You're happy. Give me one. It's the hardest thing for them to do. 
Yeah. Like, give me something, give me a practical, right, explanation of a goal. It's just, no, don't tell me you want to be happy. What the hell does that mean? Like, you're going to be happy because you reached a goal. Like, happy, you have good days, bad days. Like, like that means you feel like one day you're successful. I, I want something to tell me, I wish this, I'm happy. But then when we wish this, you, then I mean, you got it, you're happy, we can put this aside. That, that means so uh, an entire work like that. And I had people that they came back to me two weeks later to write me an email saying it took me two weeks to figure this out. Like it was always I mean, like the I, next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And, yeah, yeah I, I wouldn't I wouldn't have an answer off the top of my head. You know, like I, I had some kind of far off numbers. Uh, but, you know, if I achieved those numbers, there would have been more numbers. I mean, for example, yeah, yeah. but like, OK, but that's the thing, right? So we reached that 800 pound deadlift that you got, right? We would have been like when you got this. We achieve like we achieve a certain things. You got that. No matter what, you had that number. There's a you know there's there's a mental relaxation based on that. Whereas I know so there's a whole work there where you got the 800. You got it. That's it. You're world class. You define it before 800 is world class. You are world class. You cannot now. They, no one can ever take that away from you. Like yeah. it's like being a dad. That is something you became. Yeah. All right. No one will ever say so then we can work from there. After that, it can be, you know, then after that is gravy and everything. But you can't just have that. I want 10 more pounds, 10 more pounds. You're already in the setup of I'll never be happy. But but even at that, though, like, you know, you deadlift, you deadlift 800 and then you go, yeah. eh, I wonder if I, on my next cycle, if I could get eight, 820, you know. Yeah, um, that's, that's so, that 20. Yeah, it's the next 20 and the next 20. Like. So right. it, it was very important for me to have um, to, to have very clear definition of what the win was. And then the more I talk to anxious people, the more I realized they have absolutely no clue what they want. They just yeah. have, oh, I don't know, it's the next cycle, basically. But like, I'm like, can we just sit well, down and talk about where we're going? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that, like, from my standpoint these days, you know, it's it's not so much about pursuing uh, a, a concrete number, but it, it is about pursuing the improvement, you know, that, that my, for, for me now, speaking for myself, yeah, yeah. my goal in training is to, it is to, to see how much I can improve in, in this next cycle. And uh, there's not, I, I wouldn't say that I've got a lot of anxiety attached to that. Um, it's, it's more of like a, a uh, almost like an intellectual curiosity, although that's not quite right either. Yeah. No, know? but because now you have a quest, like it's an internal yeah. quest and everything that you're going to is, I want to find out what yeah. this was. And it can be like, I want to find out why I got in that mental stage where I needed to chase uh, this, that guy, like, okay, so how do I chase that? But not going crazy through, how do I, like there was, there was an entire thing for me, for me, Jiu Jitsu, I started when I think to be able to express anger that was pe being pe that was pent up inside and gain self confidence, I love jiu jitsu. The greatest thing that happened to me was to do jiu jitsu. You know why I lost it when I thought world champion? Mm. Because then suddenly it was about beating the other guy. Whereas before yeah. I only done jiu jitsu to improve myself, and I suddenly was beating the other guy, lost it. And yeah. I cannot go back to jiu jitsu to this day because I get so competitive in there. I have to beat people. I'm trying to find a place in my head where I can go to Jiu Jitsu to find that again. Not even the anger, just the self-confidence, just the, the joy of doing Jiu Jitsu. I have such a hard time finding it now. It, I, I lost it at Strongman for the same reason. I love Strongman because I could blast myself to oblivion where my brain would shut off. Like, surely I found myself sleeping on the parking lot because I couldn't make it back to the gym. Because I loved killing myself like that. It was, but the second I said pro Strongman, lost it. Because it wasn't about me anymore. It was about the other guys. Yeah. So it, it's about kind of maintaining that focus on. What moves you? You know, yeah. like, what makes you happy? What moves you? I guess we all have different things. But what moves you? What got you to stick to powerlifting for so long at such heavyweight? It's such a grueling lifestyle of it's so, all that stuff. Like there's, there's a deep love for it in there that led you to that. That's what moves you. We need well, to go I, find I, that, otherwise you you, yeah. you know what I mean you 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 lose it. Well, I can tell you for for me, uh, through this injury, I I learned uh, about myself. So, like I said, I, I've been focusing on front squats for the last year. It's the same to me, you know. Like all it needed to happen was I said, you know what, squatting and deadlifting. I've been trying and trying. It keeps hurting. 
I'm done. I'm just going to stop doing things that hurt for a little while. I'm so what can I do that doesn't hurt? Well, I can do front squats and I can do pull-ups. So instead of squatting and deadlifting, I'm going to do front squats and pull-ups. And when I decided that it's like it, everything changed. It, now that's my focus. The thing that I care about, uh, what I learned from this was the thing that I care about isn't powerlifting, isn't squat bench and deadlift. It's the process of improvement. It doesn't matter to me if it's better. squatting, benching, deadlifting, or front squatting. Like I get people that ask me all the time now, when when are you going to compete again? And to be honest, I don't know. I mean, I, I would like to do it again at some point, but I'm having a good time doing what I'm doing because I can go down there and I can train. I can hit it hard, as hard as I want. And nothing hurts. And at the end of the training cycle, I can either, I can see I either improved or I didn't, and that I learned something from it. You know, yeah. That so you process, got better. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that's, that's the, key, the process of getting better. That, that yeah, that drive you. Yeah, but that's now, what I'm here for. Yeah, <laughs> now you can, exactly. Now you can build a program for you, knowing like as long as I find exercises where I keep getting better, I'm getting stronger. I will enjoy it. I can. So now you can go back to competing, but while doing whatever is necessary to keep moving you forward, understanding that if you're in the right mindset, chances are you're going to do better anyway. If yeah. you're in a wrong mindset, no matter what, you end up in the same place. Sure. So it was, it was for me, the win was that. It was like, look, if that means that not all sessions will be spent on back squat, but some will be spent on front squat, good, you got stronger. I'm sure we can use it somewhere. Okay. No, yeah. And it'll be because this hurts. Okay. But then instead of like, I can't snatch right now. Okay. We can do, maybe we can strict press. I'm sure I can build something somewhere that'll make you better at snatching once, you, once we can go back to it. So let's focus on winning. Yeah. Which is getting better. Yeah, that I, to me, that I would be the, that at least cool. in my my for my side, the best win is getting better, and it sometimes it just means getting smarter. But I know, like, if I'm a better human being, chances are I'll, I'll train harder and better, and I'll do better at the end. So is whatever allows me to become better. So let me uh, see if I can tie a couple of these ideas yeah. together and and tell me if I've got it right or wrong. Um, so we've talked about. Uh, three different principles. We talked about intensity, blood flow, and win. And how that manifests itself a lot of times in, in the training that you uh, prescribe and espouse, um, you like to do sled work, right? Uh, lots of uh, heavy sled work and uh, sandbag stuff, uh, yep. loaded carries. I, yep. I see that quite, quite a lot, right? So those tools allow you to push intensity hard, Yep. Um, Safer. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, another thing that we didn't uh, really touch on was uh, kind of this idea of, of uh, weight bearing uh, yeah. eccentricity and, and skill. Yes. So, yeah. So uh, if you take pushing a sled, um, it's low weight bearing in terms of uh, load on the body, uh, no eccentric component, low skill components. So uh, easier to recover from. Um, and no reason to stop because no skill, right? So that means right. you, you can push the intensity about as close to a heart attack and not pay the price the next day. Imagine if you were to do that on a set of 100 square, like, you know, like 100 kilos or whatever. You know how you wake up the next day. You know, yeah. doing shit for a week. But I can take that kind of, at least the mental exertion of that kind of stuff. I can make you do that on a sled. And the next day you wake up, it's like never nothing happened. You'll be tired, but your body won't be beat up. Yeah. And so I can have that max intensity and that max blood flow and that win without breaking you in the process. So if we're talking about that type of intensity of experience, right? Um, and your, uh, um, I guess your tendency toward self-directed learning, um, yeah. the, uh, I'm struggling. My words are failing me at this point. <laughs> um, just kind of the, the appreciation for um, helping someone to feel the correct position, yeah. feel the correct intention rather than just tell them what it is. So you can have this massive intensity of experience. Uh, plus we want the self-directedness uh, in the learning process. Uh, and as it comes to feeling the correct positions, the correct torques, uh, the intention of movement, right? So you can put somebody on a, on a sled, uh, have them do a movement that will require them to, to do things. The, 
it rewards you, correct yeah, intention yeah. and yeah. punishes incorrect intention, yeah. right? That, and yeah. just max out the intensity on it and they'll learn on their own what exactly. works and what doesn't because it, it, you know, as they're trying to push harder and harder, they'll, they'll find it. And, and that to me is the fundamental thing because uh, going back to computer science, the, the very important, it's called reinforcement learning, right? This is how they, they, they are teaching the new artificial intelligence. Like there's one that is called Alpha Zero that I talk about all the time. It was, it's the next stage versus AlphaGo who they did a Netflix documentary on it. It's a learning machine basically, and it's learning art artificial intelligence. And the idea was it learns by itself. Whereas if you look at us humans for, the, for as long as, I, as society has been around, it's been supervised learning, which means someone telling you, hey, this is a proper way. This is what school is teaching you. It's like, repeat what I say. And if you don't, you get a D. If you try to find your own stuff, you'll be punished for it instead of rewarded for it. Imagine you're in a maze. There's a cheese at the other end of the maze, right? The only way you're going to get through the, the, the cheese is by making random choices because you're going to have to try. Imagine if there's parts of the maze with these watering holes, part of the maze when there's electrical zappers. Welcome to life, right? You're going to get to some places where, oh, that's cool. There's, there's water. I can rest. You go out, you get zapped. If you refuse to, to take random chances, you're going to stay in the watering hole because every time you get zapped, I'm like, why would I ever go back out there? Then you're going to stay, but then you never get the cheese. Life is about random choices and learning on your own. Unfortunately, we have been told for, very, for tens of thousands of years now that basically, like the school system, do not do things random, learn what the people before you have done, learn from that and just repeat the same thing over and over again. Whereas there's an entire thing that you'll have to Google called Alpha Zero versus Stockfish. Stockfish is a world champion computer, chess computer. It's a, what they call a chess engine. It's designed to play chess. He has memorized every single game by the grandmasters. He knows every opening uh, theory and every end game table. And he calculates 70 million positions per second. So he does not understand the game of chess. He doesn't have to because he, he beats you by brute force. And then here comes Google with their division called DeepMind, who came with AlphaZero and gave AlphaZero the rules of chess and nothing else and gave Alpha Zero, four hours to learn the game. Four hours, just the rules of chess. Then he played Stockfish. Uh, Alpha Zero could calculate 80,000 positions per second. So it's 900 times weaker than Stockfish. And he, they got to play each other after four hours. Alpha Zero beat Stockfish 28 to zero. The most beautiful games I've ever seen. Alpha Zero played like a human being. He sacrificed early to achieve long-term positional advantage. So I'm talking a concept that a human understands, but a computer doesn't. Alpha Zero, the best way I can tell you that Alpha Zero understood that. He sacrificed early to get long-term quality of the game. And because he understood that he wasn't about the position, it's about winning in the long term. So he understood the difference between reward and value. And then he, done, he has done that through reinforcement learning, which forces uh, the element of randomness into the learning process. And Alpha Zero can only learn by his own mistakes. So he played 4 million games, but he played itself 4 million games. He was never allowed to look at somebody else. And so yeah. he accepted, by the way, losing 4 million times, but getting better every single time. And that's reinforcement learning. And that's where I think, like, if you look at the, that's the way evolution works, I think we found through computer science the true way of learning. We've been told supervised learning is the way, which is, I think, incorrect. So to me, the uh, giving people the capacity to learn by themselves, for themselves, how to move correctly is the greatest thing. It is not about telling them what to do. It's about make, allowing them to discover how to do it by themselves. Yeah, That's the difference. And then when I'm not there, they still know how to move. And they well, still learn to fix themselves. I, I think, and I'm, I'm quite sure that this is baked into your system at this point, that since we're uh, so limited, I think, in terms of, of time, you know, like a, a human probably, well, certainly can't play 4 million games of chess, yes. right? So uh, I think a structured learning approach up to a point 
is is probably uh, useful. It can be integrated, but it yeah. cannot be the only thing. If, by the way, really oh, absolutely, learning, for sure. Some supervised learning in it because once certain patterns are obvious, of course you want to use them. Yeah. But if it's just that, then you end up with description over function. You you just take something that is obvious without realizing you're messing it up entirely. That's been the danger of supervised learning is we have been going into dead ends and never and look how hard it is to get out for the mechanistic uh, view of the body. Yeah. Look how much trouble we're having with this. And I, to me, it, sh it shows in more than half the injuries that I see is us coaches are doing it to people with the best intention in the world, but it doesn't matter. Hell, hell is paved with them. Well, because we have such a mechanistic view of movement, we are telling them what to do with an understanding that that might not be the proper intent, therefore causing injuries and things like this. Hmm. That, that's what the problem is when supervised learning is like in a religious base, like this is what the book says, this is what we're going to do no matter what. This is where we see the biggest problem coming from. Well, I, I'm, I'm sure you've had this happen to you as well, uh, where, you know, you publish something, some kind of a program or, or whatnot, and someone will, uh, it happens to me all the time, someone will inevitably email me and say, hey, uh, I was thinking about uh, subbing out this exercise for that exercise. Do you think that's okay? You know, it's like, well, it's your program. I mean, <laughs> it's up to you, you know, you get to decide, you know. Exactly. Like, should I do that? I'm like, yes. The answer was always yes. Try yeah. it. Yeah. experiment learn know like that way you know this doesn't work or this does work or whatever this is the most right. important part otherwise what are we yeah, i mean like even like, we're going to, we're talking about the wind the wind is getting better you did not get better when you just repeat the program i gave you it's remember the parts of the caribbean it's more like guidelines anyway <laughs> uh, that's what the program is i'm like i'm trying to teach you something i'm not telling you to do anything I want to yeah. teach you something. I want to tell you, this is what I've learned through pattern of through my entire life. I found some cool stuff. Go try it. Tell me if I can help you move your needle a little bit forward. But in no way, shape or form, I'm not telling you your needle is pointing that way. I'm just saying there's a concept, there's a pattern. See if you find the same thing I do. Then we have a relationship and I can tell you where I took it. Let's see where you take it. And then it's, as you learn, I get better as well. It's, it's, relationship between humans you know what i mean like yeah. the whole they're supposed to experiment with your program they're supposed to learn something from you. it's like reading a book you can just read the words or you can try to get the meaning behind them yeah right if so, they just follow the program they just get information i want them to get knowledge out of them. right and knowledge that's, comes from experimentation that's one thing we talk about um whenever we talk about like coaching uh, uh i guess coaching philosophy uh is that we think that coaching is is really three components. We think it's it's leadership, relationship, and creativity, and specifically like creative problem solving. You know, and and all three of those have to exist at the same time in this dynamic balance, right? And I think the relationship aspect is probably the one that gets uh, ignored the most often. So much, you know, it just yeah. Yeah, so, so relationship, yeah, no, I think you're completely right. You know what I see that as sometimes is like industrial revolution, you know, like the idea that machines, like factory setting, factories are better. And if you look like, imagine you have a guy in a factory making a steering wheel, right? And he can be a craftsman and makes the best steering wheel ever. And yet has no responsibility to whether the, the car is running or not. It'll make no difference to him whatsoever. And you, I see that with a lot of coaches where, they're like, I gave you the program. My responsibility was to make the shiniest, best program ever, but yet without seeming to care whether it works or not. I'm like, that was, that's not the job. Like, I see that with actually the, the worst is probably with nutrition. I was like, I gave people a plan. <sighs> if it was that simple, everybody would have a six pack. It's not, it's, it's not that simple. Like, you, you, your responsibility towards people understand or not toward again the relationship with the person like are they understanding the program are they if they can't do it why how can right. you help them achieve the goal better yeah yeah and, and i think nutrition is a great example because i think you see that in in people who uh, kind of promote responsible nutrition coaching yeah. you know they talk about like the best diet is the one that you can follow you know, that uh, adherence being being a major component, right? Like you can have the the best 
theoretical approach in the world, but if if it's not implementable, then who cares? Then who cares? And that's uh, so. Sorry, I, I just realized I was running out of battery. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> um, yeah, but th but that's this is where I think uh, this is where you see the most is nutrition because it used to be like uh, they would give you you know like protein is four calories and all that stuff yeah. and that was the the way I mean I remember me reading about it it was bodybuilding diet and stuff like that and that's the way to do it and that's the only way to do it and then we're all going to do it like that and everything and now we like you know years and years later and realize no people can't do it so there's an evolution toward that and again uh, I love that, that new aspect of nutrition but I think coaching needs to follow that physical yeah. strength and conditioning you need to call it that like we all debate 84 versus 85 percent but there's again description versus function right that to, to me the most important part is understanding why the movement is not getting what we're trying to get out of it and that's where really the entire thing about torque was about it was like before i tell someone to squat i'm gonna have to explain it what it is first and i was the whole work with with evolution was based on that i was like it's not like we're all talking about bar, high bar versus low bar. I'm like, at the end, it's still a squat, right? So I understand there are differences, but there should be an underlying pattern to both. And so, okay, so can we start understanding that and then going to well? But to me, it always came back down to, uh, and always came back to relationship and people because the reason I started to push toward internal talk so much because I was seeing so many crossfitters coming to me with hurt shoulders from external talk on the snatch. And at some point, I was like, guys, this has to stop. Like, this is ridiculous. I see so many of you. But I didn't have an argument. I couldn't explain why I was telling them this was bad. I was like, but I was told this was good. I'm like, yeah, but it's, yeah, but I'm telling you it's not. I'm like, okay, but what's, why are you saying that versus him saying that? And I, that's when I was like, yeah, okay. I need to find a reason why I'm saying internal talk. And then that's, that's what started the whole thing. But that's why, to me, that's why I spend so much time on the how and not the what, because it always comes down to people and people need to know the how. Need to be explained the how and you, you'll get much more out of people if you can engage them that way as well. Or at least that's, that's the way I, I've always seen it. Is I, I want to see people get better. So I want to see them getting smarter as they go. I refuse to just tell them like, this is a system. I want them to understand each step so that they, they truly understand the system and they get better every little time. Not just memorization, never memorization, understanding. Yeah. And so that's so, why the week is so long, for example. Yeah. Well, so, so uh, uh, kind of with that, uh, in terms of injury prevention, and, and I know I'm, we're going uh, super long here. This is probably the longest <laughs> podcast we've ever done. But <laughs> um, as far as injuries go, uh, are there any common injuries that you see with powerlifters and kind of what, where do you, where do you see that stemming from? Yeah. Like, um, there's a bunch of stuff, for example, like, um, the idea of, you know, the S pyramid with a structure thing, like I've seen a lot of powerlifters squatting weight, they cannot walk with. So the, the problem with that is I know their, their legs are strong enough and their core most likely. You can take the upper back structure is not ready for that kind of weight. Like if I were to put that weight on a yoke, on a strongman yoke, I could tell you they, there's no way they're carrying it. Like if you're squatting a weight you can't carry, to me, that's a problem. That's telling the structure is not ready for you to handle that weight. That means every time you squat, you're putting, first of all, there's a big chance of you getting hurt. And it's telling, it's saying something uh, about your structure. I think for powerlifter, the best thing we can do is giving them a stronger structure. So we have certain numbers like that. Like for example, for you want to, uh, your yoke carry should be about 150% of your squat or at least 120. Like that should be a minimum. Like, uh, so that way, every time you're under that bar and you take it off the rack, you have full control of it. Your upper back can take it. When you come down and up, you can actually truly use your leg power to drive without having your upper back collapsing under the weight because let uh, whenever perfect perfectly balanced so imagine you have left versus right right so your terrace major on both sides supposed to handle the weight but the right one doesn't do it so now you're leaning slightly to the right so now you have to put your hips slightly under it so now you're starting to shift and now you're going to put max weight on that that's going to hurt maybe your knees but that wasn't the problem the problem is not your knees or your leg the problem is you could not hold the weight on your back correctly so we're going to have to work on that 
and yeah. something so there's a number of things like i've seen um people that can that cannot like farmers walk their deadlift for example like even at 80 percent of their deadlift and you can see the t-spine is getting collapsed completely imagine what you do every single time you deadlift past that weight like you're just not in a the proper state and so a lot of it was making sure the muscles were balanced but also that the structure could take it so there was a day uh, like i had my best results with my powerlifters, not at your levels but we had some strong ladies uh, was once a week we would do, do, do them like pure strongman workout just to make sure they could build the structure necessary for them to go heavier in their lifts. You know, that's something that, that I think is heavily neglected in powerlifting training. And I think there's, there's some other things as well, but I mean, loaded carry, you never see that. Occasionally you'll see somebody who, who uh, is, is really into rowing and, and wants, uh, wants powerlifters to, to balance their push and pull and things like that. Yeah, um, but having loaded carries as part of a, a powerlifting program, I mean, that's something that that I've that I never see really. Um, <clears throat> and and I get what you're saying as well. Like as far as uh, it, it's about being able to support the loads that you're asking your body to lift. You know, so um, talking about like farmers walk, uh, as it relates to a deadlift, like you're, you're at, well, is this a, is this a weight that you can even support before you're trying to move it? Dynamically? Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, because otherwise every, imagine even it's a, even the repetitive stress, right? Imagine if you can handle 90% of your deadlift and 90% you're going to do it for five reps. Imagine the, the repetitive stress you're putting session after session, after session, after session, something somewhere is taking, is carrying the blunt of the, the failing muscle. Like if it's your failing terrace major, whatever, something else is gonna have to bear the blunt of that. And so now you're overloading a muscle, it's doing more than it should maybe. It, by the way, it will affect your technique as well. Yeah, uh, so uh, I don't know, that's that's interesting as this gets back into uh, technique and position and intention, you know? That that intention level is, uh, is a, a a tricky bastard i guess because but like, like you know like for example like you know every time you you're going into the the squat and then your upper back can't take the load you're gonna have to find a certain position to do that it might not be the best one but you're gonna find it right yeah and so now you're doing something weird with your upper back or you have to squeeze the bar a certain way because let's say you don't have terrace major you want to go to the, the dorsi because that's what you have now you're gonna have to change your technique based on what your upper back can can do instead of whatever positioning uh, suits best for the exercise or, or whatever so it can change a number of things even on your technique because you just the second i see you compensating for something for me it's, it means trouble yeah. i never want to see someone compensate i want you under a bar at a certain weight like like you you can stay under it for a minute then i know that one squat is not you're not going to be it, be put in weird places where you have to do things you shouldn't be doing in the first place. Yeah. So and, and you're talking about like subtle things too, like yeah. not things that are are big obvious things that you're gonna yeah. see if you're just watching a video or something like that. Yeah. You're talking about these subtle yeah. positional yeah. things. And yeah. at that way that means there's no cue that can fix it. If yeah. your upper back cannot take the weight, you're gonna shift. Like what wh whatever you're gonna compensate, there is no cue that can change that. Yeah. You just haven't done the work necessary for your structure to take that weight. And for whatever, and plus it's not, I'm not blaming you. Like maybe your upper back is not necessarily that. Okay. But then we're going to have to do the work that you can, that you need to go play with that kind of weight. It's just maybe in your case is this and another guy's is going to be that, but I need that structure to be able to take the weight. Yeah. Yeah. That makes and sense. That to me is that's truly on top of all, a lot of other stuff. But the main thing I've seen with powerlifting is the lack of work on the on the structure. They become so specialized that they want to spend every living moment working on the lift. Yeah. And just that lift. And I don't quite think uh, I think they, they it will lead to trouble. Yeah, I'm uh, you know, I've come around a lot on that over the over the years. I definitely used to fall into that camp. Uh, these days um, with the I end up talking about uh, this concept that that I've been uh, this training concept I've been calling emerging strategies for uh, a little while. And it seems like it comes up in every conversation that I talk about. Um, but in that, 
in that framework, we end up spending roughly, uh, you know, 25 to 30% of our available training time uh, ends up being spent on what we call a pivot block, um, mm -hmm. where the only thing that we're, well, I shouldn't say the only thing because there's like 10 things. Uh, but what we're trying to accomplish in a pivot block is to roughly maintain strength, uh, but we're trying to reduce the overall fatigue levels in the body. And we're also trying to do things that will improve our durability, improve our uh, improve our ability to to go into the next development cycle and and succeed. You know, okay. um, so a lot of times, you know, say that you've got somebody who's you know in terrible aerobic shape, you may end up doing some aerobic capacity That's, stuff. Yeah. Uh, we end up doing a lot of things that are in different movement planes. Uh, playing around with different tempos and stuff like that to try to to balance the stiffness and uh, elasticity in uh, between the muscles and the tendons, um, you know, things like that, right? And I see, at least in my framework, the way that I write powerlifting training, I would see this being, an, that's an ideal time to include, uh, you know, structural work, I yes. guess. Yeah, because yeah, it doesn't have to be, yeah, I'm not talking about doing it necessarily all year long or, or continuously. By the way, once you reach certain numbers, then we're good. Then yeah. if you want to increase your squat by 50 kilos, okay, then we'll have to see if your structure can do it. But it's it's just a make like the, like an insurance plan, basically making sure that you're just capable of doing what you should be, so that you choose to do and not not being forced into a position ever. Well, and it's like what you said earlier as well that you know how much how much further can you get if you're just working with an athlete that doesn't get injured. You know, uh, I, I think the, the amount of time you could spend under the bar is right. ridiculous. It's a you need to take time away from the development cycles anyway. You know, you need to take that the time uh, to let the fatigue levels come back down uh, to to resensitize to that training stimulus. I mean, if you, if it's drip, 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 drip every day for you know for the whole year like how long does it take you before you've completely numbed to that stimulus you know yeah, that, so it's yeah. important to take that time away anyway and while you're taking that time you may as well uh do some other stuff so yeah and the uh the stress level too that you can cause by continuously you know imposing like uh people are very disciplined that's great but the you know it's, it, it gets you after a while it's the same lift the same way you're at the gym and everything, and you can thrive for a moment, but there's a need, the mental need for, uh, like, the body is not designed to do the same thing continuously. There's a need there on the nervous system where you're gonna, you're gonna see like the stress level is gonna go up. It needs uh, certain things. And so, yeah, I, I think, but it's, when you get successful, like it's so easy to fall into that pattern or I'm just gonna do that more of that. Yeah. And so that's where the coaching, but that we're going back with what you were saying, the relationship, with the athlete, the human aspect, that's when the trust comes in and you can have a conversation and now we can start moving forward. Yeah. But that, that's very important well, to have a relationship for that. You know, before we started this, this podcast, I asked you how much time that you had and uh, you said no limit. And I think I'm abusing that. <laughs> so um, why don't we uh, shift gears just a little bit? I want to uh, talk about, uh, some of your upcoming seminars. Yeah. Um, I know that you've got several coming up. Uh, you're going to be in Miami in mid May, then Prague in late May, uh, be in the Netherlands in late June, which, uh, we've talked about that's yeah. <laughs> I'm moving there in late June, which is kind of a, a weird small world coincidence. Oh, yeah. I know it's going to be so cool. Then, uh, Ireland in, in mid July. So, um, what do people learn uh, when they come to your seminar? Well, that's the thing is the, the first, the first base is ex mostly explaining because again, like it's um, like the base of the system. I can't really go. I try to go not in everything, but I try to let them understand what the, the how basically what, what, I, what is the idea behind everything? How come I say what I say? But the, I can't go too much into detail because it's just a seminar, but at least it'll give them I think a deeper understanding of the system so that when they go on the YouTube channel and stuff like that, they, they get at least, they don't get completely lost, right? But it's really a step one. 
into understanding the system and the system like literally we have the coaches week but that's only step two really what i take them from there is a coaching uh the mentoring program where uh on, we stay on, in touch online we have like calls every two months because it will take you eight months to a year to get fully toward the system and from there as a coach they can start to apply enfin, they start to apply it earlier but you know like to have a full grasp of the system it takes a long time because it's a it's almost like a way of looking at things more than a yeah. So, so it's never going to be a method. It's always going to be a system, like yeah. a set of principles that can apply that basically how to learn. If you look at it, that's really what this is. And so it takes time to, to, to that. And the seminar is the first step toward that. So I'd say, look, this is what the system looks like. This is why I think this. So then they have the chance to also ask me the questions directly is to you say those outlandish things that go against a lot of very set, uh, that, that were said a certain way. Why? How come? And I'll, I'll explain. So I'll explain the whole thing. We're like, this is why I came from. This is what I saw. This is what I think. This is my reasoning. Tell me if you think I'm crazy or not. Yeah, and so right. it allows me to have a connection directly to them to say like, this is why I think what I think. So usually they leave the seminar with more questions than they came in with, which is a little bit of a strange thing. But um, that's been mostly mostly that. I want them to see, to have a, 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 the beginning of the understanding of the system. Okay. And so yeah. I want them to live with basically also better understanding on how to learn. If I can do that, I'm happy. Excellent. Then, and then hopefully get also like get to talk to coaches and, and, you know, gym owners about, you know, what we talked about like relationship to the human aspect of coaching, yeah. what it entails, like getting, it's not just running a business. It's more than that. It's just getting in touch with people and trying to turn and change, you know, you change lives. Yeah. And so the, the, those are the parts that matter a lot to me and i would like to see the fitness industry uh just dealing with human beings a bit more let's put it this way yeah yeah and then the the coaches week being step two you get to go i mean it being a week and you get to go into a lot more depth exactly into yeah. the system because now we can talk about the precise aspect and like there's a number of things with the nervous system that are very important because i think again like we um if I'm correct with the torsions and the nervous system, that means there's a lot of things that apply to the nervous system that can be applied to exercise, to programming and things like this. And then I can go into, into depth because then that opens up certain doors and certain rabbit holes and I can go much deeper into this. But it just keeps going. The depth keeps going and going and going and going. So I need steps to go through all of that. Yeah. But that... I can just bombard people too much. So <laughs> Right. I mean, there's... I mean, just time itself is a yeah. limiting you know but uh if anybody is is interested in in signing up for that uh looking into more details about locations and whatnot or uh, anything along those lines you can go to strongfit.com slash seminars and uh that's where all that information will be um, yep. yeah so um it, i mean I, I suppose that that we've probably covered most uh parting thoughts at this point but uh anything else that uh, you'd like anybody listening to know? Um, uh, I'm sure there'll be more, and we'll do this again. But <laughs> of I'm, course, uh, yeah. Covered a lot of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, if anyone wants to connect with you, uh, it seems like uh, Instagram is is maybe yeah, uh, one of the better ways. A strong fit one, and then they can, can, can get in touch with me there. I don't yeah. spend that much time on social media anymore. But uh, they Probably can get the best. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, I'm a single dad. I raised a 13 year old. She needs my time as well, and and working on the system is yeah. My, and then I have all my coaches on the mentoring program. I have to take care of. So, but yeah. they can get in touch with me there. Awesome, excellent. Well, thanks again for your time. Thanks for letting me uh, uh, take up so much of your day. Uh, this is an awesome awesome. conversation, and I, I do hope we get to do it again. Yes, we will. And then I'll see you in Holland anyway soon. I know, right? <laughs> Excellent. Reactive Training Systems.